last class, uh, at least the last two classes, we spent time talking about what a database looks like at a high level, at the logical level. What, do you, what does the application programmer see? They see relational tables, they see SQL. And so now what we want to talk about is how we're we actually going to build the software that's going to manage this database system. Right? This is essentially what the course is about. Right? How are we actually going to store a database and, or, and, and allow queries to execute and you know, derive new data from it? So the overall outline for the course, again, we've, we've already covered the logical part at the, at the top, the relational databases. And now we're starting to go, be going through different parts of a database system one by one as if, they're, like, as if different layers. So we'll start talking about storage, query execution, current control recovery, and then we'll get to like distributed databases and other topics at the, at the end. And again, the way to think about this, this is a gross approximation of what a database looks like. It's just a bunch of layers built on top of each other, right? So we're going to focus on th this lecture and the next lecture on, the, on the, the disk manager. How do we actually store data you know, on files on disk? And then above that, once we know what API we're going to expose to the upper levels in the system, we start adding those extra levels until, we, until at the end we have a full featured database minimum system. So that's the way to think about what we're going to talk about at this point. So we're no more SQL stuff, no more... Uh, you know, relational model stuff. Aspects of it are going to be important for how we make different design decisions in our system. But again, we, you know, we have to figure out how we're actually going to run SQL queries. But it's not like we're going to worry about how to write, you know, you know, complex SQL queries because we've already done that. Okay. So again, we're focusing on different levels of the system, different layers, one by one, and then you know, sort of going up the stack. So as I said in the first lecture as well, this course is about building disk-oriented database management systems. So just, just to reiterate what I mean by that, a disk-oriented database system is one where the software makes the assumption that the primary storage location of the database is on disk. And so that means that any single time we, we have to execute a query, it may actually want to run, you know, want to access data that's not in memory, and we got to go out in the disk and get it. And there's a bunch of components in, in how we design our software that are going to be based on this assumption to protect ourselves from losing data, having you know, in, invalid or incorrect data. Right? So this assumption is going to permeate all throughout the entire system, and we, be, we need to be aware of that at any given time, something we're trying to read is not in memory. So to understand this a bit further, we want to make the distinction between volatile and non-volatile storage. So essentially what we're trying to do is we're trying to have the data system manage the movement of data from non-volatile storage into volatile storage. So what do I mean by that? The way to think about the storage hierarchy of, of computers is, 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 as, is as such, right? You sort of start at the very bottom, or sorry, at the very top, you're going to have things that are being very fast, very expensive, and very small. So the way to think of this is like a spectrum. At the top, you have things that, like CPU registers or CPU caches, L1, L2, L3. These things are very fast, right? But they're going to be very small capacity because they're, they're like literally sitting on the CPU itself. Then we're going to have DRAM. And then below that, we'll have SSDs, spinning disk hard drives, and network storage. Again, at the bottom, they're very large, but they're much slower, and they're cheaper. So again, the dichotomy that we care about is this division line here. So anything above this line is volatile. What does that mean? Yes? Yes, you said it's not, it's not persisted when you lose power. Absolutely. So all these storage devices require constant uh, energy, right? like electricity to maintain whatever they're storing, right? You pull the power from your computer, everything in DRAM gets wiped, everything on your CPU caches get wiped. Everything below this is non-volatile, meaning it doesn't require constant power in order to persist whatever was stored in it. So that's the, at, at a high level, that's the major thing that we care about, that we have to move data from here up into here. There's other aspects of this, though, that are, that are, gonna, uh, that are gonna affect how we design our software, and that has to do how we actually can access this data. So if it's in volatile storage, it's going to support fast random access, meaning we can jump to any sort of address location in the storage device very quickly. Uh, and we're going to get roughly the same performance no matter what order we access, th access things. I mean, if I jump to this location, then this location, and maybe back to another location, I'm going to get approximately the same latency, the same speed. Now in vol no, sorry, non-volatile storage, they're going to have, instead of having byte addressable access, they're going to have block addressable access. So in byte addressable access, that means that I want to read 64 bits at this storage location. I can just go read just that 64 bits and get exactly what I want. I'm oversimplifying, but that's essentially how, from the programmer's perspective of us as the database system developer, that's what we, we see. 
In a non-volatile storage, we can't go get exactly just the 64 bits that we want. We have to go get the block or the page that has that data that we want. And we have to get everything that's along with that page. So if I only want to read 64 bits, and that that you know, it's, and it's a non-volatile storage. I have to go get the four kilobyte page that it's stored in, and then go pick out the, just the piece that I want. Another aspect of this is that the, the, these systems also uh, usually have faster sequential access, meaning if I read uh, a bunch of contiguous blocks in the storage device, I can do that very more efficiently than just reading random locations. And the, and the easiest way to visualize this is just think about like a spinning disk hard drive, right? Most laptops or every laptop pretty much doesn't come with a spinning disk hard drive. But at a hot, you know, basically the way it works is that you have this arm that's physically moving on the platter, like, like, a, like a turntable, like a vinyl record. And so every single time you got to jump to another location, you have to pick the arm up and move it to another location. And that, that's a physical movement, and it's very expensive and slow. SSDs don't have this problem because it's, it's solid state, but there's other issues. So in these storage devices, we want to try to maximize the amount of data that we can read that's sequential, right? And these ones, we, and the, the volatile storage, we don't care as much. So... For the purposes of this course, we're just going to say that anything that's in DRAM, we're just going to call this memory. Right? That, that's what we, we mostly care about, how we actually put things into memory. And then anything below this, this line here, we're just going to say this is disk. And for all, most of the algorithms and most of the methods we're going to talk about in this course, we don't care whether it's, 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 you know, which, which, which one of these it is. Um, it's not entirely true when we talk about joins, because sequential access matters a lot. Uh, but we'll come to that later. And so I don't think the textbook talks about network storage. Usually they always, when you see these kind of hierarchies, they always have uh, tape drives at the bottom, but nobody runs databases on those anymore. Those are only for like disaster recovery. So network storage would be like EBS or S3 on, on Amazon. So the reason why we're not gonna talk about these things at the top uh, is that we focus on these things in the advanced course in the spring. And for our purposes in this class, this, this course in this semester, this is so slow anyway that who cares how fast we can be uh, you know, putting things in CPU registers. In the advanced class, we assume the database is always here in DRAM, and therefore these things actually matter. But for this entire semester, we won't really talk about worrying about things sitting in CPU caches, because it doesn't matter because going to disk is so slow. Now, I always talk about this every year. There is actually a, uh, a new class of storage devices that sort of straddles the line called non-volatile memory. Who here has heard of this before? Who here has heard, heard Intel Optane memory? One, two, three. All right. Yeah. So that's so Intel is actually the first manufacturer that has actually put released this. Everybody's been working on this for like 15, 20 years. Intel actually put the first one. Uh, it's, it's put out the first devices. So it's like DRAM, where it sits in the DIMM slot and it's byte addressable, but it's like an SSD, meaning if you pull the power on the machine, it, it persists all your data. All right. So this is super cool. This is like the future of what computers are going to look like. And eventually, we'll have to rewrite this class uh, to take this into account, but we're not there yet. It's not widely available. Um, now, again, this is something I've been working on for a while. So this is a, a book that I wrote with my first PhD student. Um, it was basically his dissertation they put into book form. But I think this is the future. We're just not there yet. It's not widely available. Like, you can't get it on Amazon yet. But eventually, a lot of will talk about what, what could go away if you have non-volatile memory. All right, so let's talk about how slow these things are. So there's, again, there's different tables on the internet that have different numbers, but this, these are approximately the same, you know, roughly in the same ballpark. The thing that matters most is the orders of magnitude that, that's different between these storage devices. So let's say I need to read a 64 bits uh, from, from a different storage device. If I'm in L1 cache, then it's like half a nanosecond. If it's in L, L, L2, it's seven nanoseconds and so forth until you get uh, to, to really long, long delays. So again, this is why we're going to spend all this time in this class worrying about how, we're, how we can try to minimize the impact of reading data from disk, right? Because there's a pretty big difference between you know, 100 nanoseconds and, and 150,000 nanoseconds. And so er for every single query, if we always have to go out the disk, then we're screwed, right? The thing's going to be essentially grind to a halt and we're not going to get any work done. And I realize putting this in terms of nanoseconds is hard for us to, as humans to, to wrap our heads around. So if you just replace nanosecond with seconds, then you start to realize how long these numbers actually are, right? Uh, so the way to think about this is like in, uh, another metaphor I like to use from, from Jim Gray, a famous database uh, researcher, is that say that I want to read a book. I want to I want to read a page in a book. So if it's in L1, then it's just like reading the book right in front of me on this table. If it's in L2, then maybe it's going across the room to read it. If it's in uh, if it's in DRAM, then I got to go walk to the library. And then now you're starting to get to these you know larger and larger orders of magnitude. 
And if you have to read it from a tape drive, it's like flying to Pluto to read a page in a book, right? It just takes forever. So again, this is why people don't want to store data on this, but in the old days, they, they had to. All right, so the goal of what we're trying to do in our database system is that we want to provide the illusion to the application that we have enough memory to store their entire database in memory. So essentially, like, you know, there's a fine amount of memory on our machine, and we want to, say, we want to store a database that exceeds the amount of memory that's available to us, but without having to, you know, grind to a halt every single time we, we, we read something or write something, right? So again, that's what the focus in this course is, and, and, and the next three lectures is really about how can we be careful on any single time we got to read something from disk or, or run a query that we minimize that impact. And we're going to do a bunch of different tricks to, to mitigate this problem by allowing different threads or different queries to run at the same time, by caching things, by pre-computing some data. There's a whole bunch of slew of tricks that we're going to have in our database system that we have to, essentially around uh, avoiding this long, long, long problem. So let's look at a high-level diagram of what a disk-oriented database system looks like from the perspective that we care, out, care about at, at this point in the semester. And then we'll see how, in the rest of the lecture, how we're actually going to fill in and, and, uh, and design these things. So again, at the lowest layer, we have the disk. And we have our database file or files, it doesn't matter. Um, and then we're going to represent these through different blocks or pages. Right? The page is the canonical term you use to describe this. Uh, sometimes slip and say block, but at a high level, they mean the same thing. So now in memory, we're going to have what's called a buffer pool. And this will focus on this in the lecture next week, and this is what you'll be implementing in the, in the first assignment, the first project. So there's some higher level layer in the system, an execution engine, a query engine. We don't care what it is, but it's going to make requests to our buffer pool and say, hey, I want to read page two. Page two is not in memory, so we've got to go look in the page directory on disk and say, here's the list of the pages that I have. Here's where to find them. So I, now I can go find where page two is. I bring it into memory, and now I hand off to my, uh, to my execution engine Here's the pointer to page two in memory. And then it can interpret it, do whatever it wants. We don't care. All right, so this is what we're focusing on here at, for the next three lectures. It was how we actually build this part here. All right? So today and next week, we'll, we'll do, discuss what the, the database files look like on disk. Next week will be the buffer pool. And then later and so forth, we'll talk about how we actually represent the, the directory. OK? So what does this look like? If you take an operating system course, what does this sound like? I'm trying to ha make it appear that I have more memory than I actually do. Virtual memory, exactly. So now you may be thinking, all right, I've taken OS course here. Why, why do I want to have my databases manage memory like this? It seems like a big waste of time, and the OS can already do this, right? Well, it, it's not a good idea. Here's why. So in, in operating system parlance, we would call this memory map files, or there's a sys call called mmap uh, in, in, in POSIX. And essentially what this does, it takes a file on disk, and you tell the operating system, map the file's pages into the address space for my process. And now I can read and write to those, those, those memory locations, and if it's not in memory, the OS brings it in, I can, I can write to it, and then eventually if I can tell the OS to, to write it out for me. I can do an msync and write it back out the disk. So we're essentially giving up control of the movement of, of memory back and forth, or data back and forth between disk and memory, and letting the operating system manage this for us. Right? So, again, at, at a high level, it looks like this. We have, a, we have a bunch of pages on disk file, and then in memory, the OS has its virtual memory page table, and we have physical memory. So what happens is, the application says, hey, I want to read page one. It looks in the virtual memory. We get, it, we get a page vault and say, this thing's not backed by physical memory. It's, not, it's still out on disk. We go fetch it, back it into a physical memory page, and then update our page table to now point to that, that memory location. So if I come along and I want to read page three, I go through the same process, I fetch it into memory, and then the application can do whatever it wants. But now let's say that I read page two. What's the problem? Right, there's, there's, no, there's no free physical memory page to put, put, this, uh, put this page in, so I need to make a decision of which of these pages to remove. And while I'm doing this, I eventually have to stall the database system, I stall my thread that requested this page, because now the, 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 disk, the, you know, the, the, the disk scheduler for the operating system is going to go out to pay, the disk, fetch it, and bring it to memory. So 
you, there's tricks, to, there's ways to figure out from the application pr perspective, am I about to read something that's not in memory? So maybe that could hand it off to another thread so it stalls and not me, because I always want to try to keep doing useful work, right? Because I want to mitigate the, 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 the stalls when I have to go out the disk, right? But essentially, the operating system doesn't know exactly what, what the hell we're doing. It doesn't know anything about what the data system is doing. It just sees a bunch of reads and writes to pages. It doesn't understand any of the high level semantics about what a query is, what data wants to read, right? So we want to, we want to, by going with virtual memory, by going with memory map files, we're giving up controls or giving up knowledge that we have inside our database system over to the OS that, that's blind and doesn't know anything, right? So if we're only reading data, there's a bunch of syscalls we can to, to, to mitigate some of these problems. Uh, but if we start writing things, then it becomes problematic because now the OS doesn't know that certain pages have to be flushed out the disk before other pages do. Again, we'll cover this later when we talk about logging uh, and concurrency control. But the OS just sees, yeah, I need, to write, I need to write some data out. Let me just go ahead and write it out. It doesn't know whether that was an okay thing to do or not. So you can get around this by, give, again, by giving it hints, like using mAdvise to tell it how you're going to access certain pages, whether it's sequential or random, how to prevent pages from getting paged out, although you can, mLock doesn't prevent it from getting written out, which, again, could just still be a problem. And then this is when you can tell it to flush. So... I would say that memory map files of virtual memory sounds like a seductive thing we want to use in our database system. And every year some student says, why, why are we doing all this buffer pool thing? Why can't we just let the, the OS do this for us? And trust me, you, you don't want to do this because it, it, it can be, you have performance bottlenecks and you'll have uh, correctness problems. So there's not very many systems out there that actually use mmap. Uh, the most famous two are probably MonadDB and LMDB. LevelDB, if you ever heard of that from Google, uh, is, is another one. Elasticsearch is a, a search engine or a document store. And then RavenDB is a, is, a, is a JSON database out of uh, Israel. So all these guys use MMAP, but there's a bunch of extra stuff you have to do to, to prevent the OS from doing things that are incorrect. Or there's certain limitations or assumptions you have to make about what the OS is allowed to do. There's not very, so this is like, I mean, there's a few more, but there's not very many. So what, what's missing here? We're missing all the major database systems. Postgres, MySQL, Oracle, DB2, SQL Server. None of those guys use MMAP because it's a bad idea because you're giving up control and the data system can always do better than what the operating system can try to figure out. So there's some systems that still use MMAP in very limited cases. This is actually out of date. I mean, I talked to the guy last week. MemSQL got rid of MMAP entirely. Uh, SQLite has a special engine. You have to tell it, I want to use MMAP. For some you know, embedded devices, that's, that's actually what you want to use. By default, you don't get this. InfluxDB only uses this for like, read-only caches. But the example I always like to give, talk about is, is MongoDB. Everyone that's here has, has heard of MongoDB before, right? It's a famous JSON database system. So when they first started, their, their default storage engine or storage manager was using MMAP. And there's a bunch of crap they had to do to make that thing actually work. But it was a, it was a super pin... It was a big bottleneck for them. And then they raised a lot of money. And then the first thing they did was got rid of MMAP and got a, you know, bought this thing called WireTire, which was a non-MMAP storage engine. So if MMAP was a good idea, these guys had all the money in the world, had some top engineers, they could have figured it out, but it was just, it became untenable. So if I die uh, in this class and you want to you know, have a memorial or something, just say Andy hated MMAP. You can, you can, you can publicly say these things, okay? We're actually working on a paper, paper uh, and the let this year and actually proving that is a bad idea. All right, so the main takeaway I want you to get from this is that the database system is all, can always do better. It always knows exactly what's, what the queries are trying to do. It knows what the workload looks like, and therefore it can make the best decision. The operating system doesn't know anything. It just sees a bunch of, again, reads and writes, read and write calls. So some of the things that we'll talk about maybe late in the semester or that we can do if we're not using MMAP uh, is, is like prefetching, better replacement policies, better scheduling. Again, the OS is sort of a general purpose pickup truck, whereas we can tune our system like, like a Porsche or Ferrari to be exactly what we want to do for application. So another main takeaway is that the operating system is not your friend. We don't want to rely on it. We want to try to avoid it as much as possible because it's going to make decisions that could be hurtful to our database system. So it's like a frenemy. You need it to survive, but ideally you don't want to talk to it. All right. All right. So for database storage, this is what we're going to focus on today. So there's two main problems we have to uh, uh, take care of. The first is how we're going to represent the data on files on disk. And the second is that uh, how we're actually going to manage the movement of memory back and forth right, between the disk files and the buffer pool. So for this lecture today, we're going to focus on this problem, 
Next class, we'll also focus on this problem. And then starting when we talk about buffer pools on Wednesday next week, we'll, we'll focus on the second problem. OK? All right, so today's lecture, again, we're going to deal with that first question. How are we actually going to represent the, the database on files on disk? So we're going to first talk about how we're going to organize the, the, the database across a sequence of pages. Then we'll talk about how we're actually going to store the pages inside those, those files. And then we'll talk about what's actually the, what do the tuples look like inside those pages. All right, so we're going to go sort of at, at a macro level and deep, you know, step down to you know, inside the, the, the data that we're actually storing. All right, so at the end of the day, the database is just a bunch of files on disk. Some systems store the database as one file, like SQLite does that. For the first homework, you download that .db file. That's the entire database encapsulated in that single file. Most other systems, however, store things in, in, across multiple files. If you ever look at like, the, the, the data directory for MySQL and Postgres, you'll see a bunch of different directories, a bunch of different files. Right? You do this because you know, databases could be very, very large, like petabytes, and you don't want to you know, you don't want to hit up the file system limitation of a file, you know, the size of a file. So again, the OS doesn't know anything about what's in these files. It just, there's a bunch of binary data. To the operating system, they're not special. But the, the format for these database files are typically proprietary or specific to the database management system. So meaning you can't take a SQLite file, plop it down inside a directory for MySQL, and, and think MySQL is going to be able to read it. Right? They're always, they're always specialized to whatever the software is. So, these files, were, these files for the database, we're typically just going to store them on top of the regular file system that the OS provides us. ext3, ext4, whatever Windows net has now, I forget. Uh, right, these are just, and the OS just sees a bunch of files, and we're going to rely on the file system to provide us with basic read-write APIs. In the 1980s, people did try to build database systems that used custom file systems on raw storage devices. So like, say you plop down a new hard drive, Instead of formatting it and you know, setting it up for NTFS or WinFS or XTXT4, you say, screw all that, just give me the raw storage device, and I'll, I'll, rant, I'll, I'll manage what's, what's actually being stored in it myself. Uh, some of the enterprise systems, like, that, like an enterprise meaning like high-end ones like Oracle, DB2, and SQL Server, will still do this. Uh, but most of the new database startups or any of the new database systems that's come out in the last 10 years or 15 years doesn't do this. Right, because it's the engineering effort to make your own custom file system for your database system is, is not worth it. You get maybe like a 10% improvement, but now you, you, you know, you're managing your own file system, which is a big pain. And it makes your thing less portable because now you can't easily run it on, on Amazon and, and other, other hardware vendors. So what we're building essentially is now, is, is what, again, what is called a storage manager. Sometimes also called the storage engine. And in, this is the piece of the software, the component in our database system that is responsible for maintaining our database files on, on disk. Uh, now, the, we could do reads and writes and let the OS schedule things. Some of the more high-end database systems will actually have a shim layer uh, right, right above the file system that does, allows the, the database system to do its own disk scheduling. Uh, you do this so that, like, if I know if I have a bunch of threads writing to blocks that are, that are close to each other, I can maybe com combine them together and do a single write request. Right? The OS can kind of do these things, but again, it doesn't know exactly what's above. It doesn't know what the semantics of the queries are above it. Most systems don't do this, and then for the, the project we'll be working on here, we don't do this. Uh, it's typically for the higher ones. Yes? Yes. Her question is, uh, I said that most data systems split up the file, uh, the database files into multiple files because you don't want to hit the, the file size limit of the operating system. Is there any optimization for putting things in memory? No, is there a like, so the file has like an alternate size and the amount of memory? Yes. Does the file, oh, your question is, does the file have a limit for the amount of, the size it can be in memory? Yes. With, so with virtual memory, no. I mean, it's up to, this, to whatever the, the, the swap size is of what the OS lets you store. But if it's, it's essentially limited to the, the physical memory that's available to you. Her question is, uh, would it be better to have a single file because then you get, the over, you get rid of the overhead of having multiple files? Uh, what do you mean by the overhead? Like the inodes that, you're, that you have to find to go open a file or what? I mean, I'm just saying like when you have to build files, you have to store exactly like, um, like the name and the addition of the file and like, there was, you have like limits to it. 
Okay, so, so yeah, so you're talking like the metadata. So her statement is, if I have one file, then I have one file name and I have one inode in my file system that points to it. If I have multiple files, then I have multiple inode entries, or, and each one has their own file name and a bunch of metadata, you know, referencing it. But like, that's what? Maybe a kilobyte of metadata? It's nothing, right? If your database is one petabyte, who cares that you have a bunch of file names, right? I, at, at that, think really large scales, it doesn't make a difference, right? I like. For, I think now for like for modern file systems, it's not really an issue anymore. Like you can have like exabyte, you know, single files that are exabytes. But think of like in the '90s, or early 2000s, when like people were running like FAT32, you can only have a four gigabyte file, right? So that's back in the days, it, it mattered more. Not so much now. But the, even then, the metadata doesn't matter. Yes. So don't operating systems like limit how many files like a process can create? Like unless you have like certain permissions. Like, his statement is, doesn't this limit the number of files that you can have open? Is usually the open file handles the number of things you can create. Uh, and therefore, you have to have permissions to do this. Absolutely, yes. And so if you go look at like the tuning guides or setup guides for a bunch of different data systems, they'll talk about like tune this kernel parameter to allow you to have a bunch of, you know, this number of inodes or file handles open. Absolutely, yes. OK, awesome. All right, again, so we're trying to build a storage manager. And the storage manager is responsible for maintaining these files on disk. And whether it's one file or multiple files, it doesn't matter. So now, within these files, we're going to organize them as a collection of pages. And so our storage manager is going to keep track of all the reads and writes we're going to do to these pages. And it's going to keep track of, of what, available space, what space is available to us to store new data in our pages. So a page is essentially just a fixed size chunk or block of data. That we're, we're, just, we're gonna organize our file in, you know, in, into these chunks. So a page can contain anything, right? It, it can contain the actual tuples, the, data, the database itself, contain metadata, indexes, log records. From the storage manager's perspective, it doesn't really matter, right? But we always have to store things within the, the, a single page. So now some database systems will allow, require you that to have the, uh, the page be self-contained. What I mean by that is all the information you need to know on how to interpret and comprehend the contents of a, of a page have to be stored within the page itself. So let me give an example. Let's say that I have a table uh, and I have the table has 10 columns and they have different types. Right? I call create table and I create the table with different attributes. So I could have the metadata about what's in that table stored in one page and then all the tuples for that, page, for that, that table stored in another page. So the problem is now, if I have a disk failure, like my, my data center catches on fire, my disks melt, and I lose that one page that tells me what, what the layout of the, the schema is, now I don't know how to easily interpret what the contents are of my, of my tuple pages. And so some systems like Oracle, for example, require all the metadata about how to say, here's what's in that page, has to be within the page itself. So that way, if you lose any other page, it doesn't affect, you know, you lose one page, it doesn't affect any other pages. You think this, there's a bit overhead to this, this seems crazy. Well, they do it for disaster recovery. Again, so now, again, the machine catches on fire and you lose a bunch of pages, you can, you can, you can literally open up a hex editor and try to reconstruct what the database was by looking at page, one page at a time. And all the metadata you need about what's in that page is stored within, within itself. All right, so other thing we, that's important to understand is that we're not gonna mix different types, types of data within a page. Uh, there's some research systems that do this where you can have, you know, one page have tuple data and log record data for our purposes here. And most systems, they don't do this. It's like, here's a page that only stores tuples. Here's a page that only stores index information. So now each page is going to be given a unique, uh, internal identifier that the database system is going to generate for us, a page ID, right? And we're going to have then now have an indirection layer. And this is going to be a reoccurring theme when we talk about storage, we're going to have an indirection layer that's going to allow us to map a page ID to some location in a file at some offset, right? And we want to do this because now underneath the covers, we can start moving pages around, you know, if we start compacting the disk or, or you know, set up another disk, and it doesn't change our page ID because we would have this, this page directory say, you want page one, two, three, here's where to go find it. So there's a bunch of different page, page concepts we need to talk about to, to, again, put, to put it in the context of how real computers work. So at the lowest level, we're going to have what's called a hardware page. This is, this is the page API or page access level you get from the actual storage device itself. Right, this is what the SSD or spinning disk hard drive exposes. This is typically four kilobytes. Then above that, you have an operating system page. 
And again, that's as you as you take things out of the storage device and put it into memory, right? They they represent that as an internal page as well, and that's typically usually four kilobytes uh, by default in Linux and Windows. There's things like huge pages where you can turn it. You can take a one gig, gig one gigabyte page could be broken up to multiple four kilobyte hardware pages, but for our purposes, we don't care about. The thing we care about is the database page here, right? And this is going to vary between different systems. So at the low end, at 512 bytes, that's like something like SQLite, like an embedded system. But then at the high end, you'll have like 16 kilobytes. That could be like MySQL. So different database systems do different things, and there's different trade-offs for all of these, right? The main thing we're going to care about, though, is that the Harvard page is, is the sort of the lowest level that we can do atomic writes to the storage device, and typically four kilobytes. So what I mean by that is say I need to modify a bunch of data, the hardware can only guarantee that if I do a write and flush to the disk, it, it can only guarantee that at, at four kilobytes at a time, it's going to be atomic. So I'm going to tell you what I mean by that. So like, if I say I need to write 16 kilobytes, I could try to write the, uh, say, I tell the disk, hey, write 16 kilobytes for me, and it might crash before, you know, it writes the first eight kilobytes, then it crashes before writing the next eight kilobytes, and then you come back, and now you have a torn write. You only see the first half and not the second half. Because the hardware can only guarantee four kilobytes at a time. All right, this will come up. This, we'll talk about this more later when we talk about logging and concurrent control, but this is something we need, we need, need to be mindful of. And again, there's different systems do different things. The high-end systems, like Oracle, SQL Server, and, and DB2, you can actually tune it so you can say, I want to start things at 4 kilobytes, 8 kilobytes, or 16 kilobytes. You can even vary, say, for index pages, storm is larger page sizes, and then data pages sort of smaller. Right? You can go crazy and, and do a bunch of different things. All right, so now we want to talk about how we're going to represent the, 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 the page storage architecture. So again, there's different ways to do this. And there's different trade-offs for this. Uh, the most common one is going, to, is going to be the heap file organization, so we'll focus on that. But the, the thing to understand is that at this point, at this lowest level in the storage manager, we don't care about what's actually in our pages. We don't care whether it's index data or tuple data. We don't care. You ask us for a page, we'll get you that page. right? Or you ask us to delete a page, we'll delete it. So a database heap file is an unordered collection of pages where the tuples or the data can be stored in random order. So again, the relational model doesn't have any uh, ordering. So if I insert tuples uh, one by one, I'm not guaranteed that they're going to be stored that way on disk. Because it doesn't matter, because I write SQL queries and that have no notion of, of ordering. So the API we need to have, again, is being able to, to, to read and write and access pages at a time, as well as being able to iterate over every single page that we have in case we need to do a sequential scan across the entire table. We'll have some additional metadata to keep track of what pages we have, which ones have free space, so that if we need to insert new data, we know where to find a page to go ahead and do that. Right? And internally, we can represent this heap file in, in a bunch of different ways. Again, at the lowest, uh, the lowest level, we're going to organize these in pages. And then within these pages, we can represent them with different data structures. So let's first talk about doing linked lists, because that's sort of the dumb way to do this, or nobody actually does this, but it, it exists. And then we'll see the page directory way, which is, is a better approach. So the way we're going to do this, again, the goal of this, we, what we're trying to do here is we're trying to figure out within my file, I have a bunch of pages, what pages, you know, wh wh where those pages exist and what kind of, you know, whether they have data or not, or whether they have free space for me to store stuff. So in the header of this, of this heap file, or sorry, the, the, for this linked list, we're just going to have two pointers. We're going to have one pointer that says, here's the list of the free pages that I have in my file, and here's a list of the, the, the pages that actually have, are completely full or occupied. Right? So then again, this is just a linked list. So it doesn't matter where these pages are stored. It doesn't matter whether they're contiguous or not. I just I now have just pointers and say, hey, here's you know here's the data that you know here's here's the first page in my linked list that where they're occupied, and here's a pointer to the next one. So if now I, if I want to say find me a page a free page that I can store stuff, I can follow the free page list, look in here and, and you know and traverse along until I find something that has enough space for what I want to store. And because we need to go possibly and iterate in reverse order, we need pointers on the way back as well. Yes? Why is the heap file unordered? The question is, why is the heap file unordered? Think at a high level, like the, the, uh, the data we're storing does not need to be ordered as we insert it. 
right? So if I insert like three tuples, I could insert, I could in my, my page layout, the actual inside the pages, I could have tuple three, tuple two, tuple and one. I'm not required to put them in the order that they're given. But if you have to locate a particular page, then you have to traverse the whole database list, right? Right, so this question is just, if you had to look for a particular page with these linked list things, I have to traverse the, potentially the entire linked list to find what I want. Absolutely, yes, this sucks. <laughs> this is a bad idea, I'm saying, yeah. Because, uh, if it is ordered, then you can always search faster, right? His question is, if it's ordered, you can always search faster. Right, so there's different trade-offs. So I have no metadata to say where I have free pages. So I need to insert something now. Where am I going to insert it? Now I essentially have to do a sequential scan and look at every single page until I find one that has free space. Or in this approach here, I'm not saying this is, I'm not saying this is the right, I'm not saying at a high level this is the right way to do it. I'm saying this is how this works. If I need, if I have this one here, then I can just go follow this pointer to find the first free page and see whether it has enough space for what I want to store. It's a trade off, right? I can either go do, you know, almost binary search to find exactly the page that I want, or I can just do, I can do this linked list. Can you maintain ordered sets for both free pages and databases? The statement is you can maintain ordered sets for both free pages and 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 field pages? Yes. Just ordering on the page ID, right? Instead of a link list, just use a tree. <sighs> well, the statement is, instead of using a link list, use a tree. A link list can still be ordered, right? So you could say, all right, say I delete all the tuples from this page, and it's, and it's page two, and this is page one, this is page three, so I could insert it in between these two guys. Sure. Uh, why, why are we not ordered? Like, we make two different sets, three pages and data pages, and keep both of, both of them ordered. Order what? On the page ID? Yeah, like if you want to search for a... But I'm... Again, I think you're, you're, the page ID is just like, a, like an all set in it, right? It's not, this is sort of a logical thing built on top of the heap file. Let, let's, we, we can take this offline, if, if you don't understand it. This question over here, or? Okay, let's keep going. And if you have questions, we, we talk about it further. Okay, the, the main takeaway of this, this is a bad idea. Nobody does this. this is, so I, I, I don't want to dwell on it too much. What people typically do is having a page directory. And for this one, it's a, we have a page now, again, in the header of our file that's going to maintain the, uh, a mapping from page IDs to their offset. Uh, and then we can also maintain some additional metadata in this directory to say, hey, here's the amount of free space that's available to me in, in a particular page. So now when I want to go say I, I want to insert some data, I don't have to go to, you know, scan the, that list. I can just look at my page directory and find everything that I need, right? So again, my pages are just ordered sequentially like this, and then this is just a, a mapping to, to where they're, they're located, right? So the important thing about this, going back to what we talked about, about the, the, the atomic rights for, the, for hardware, so now I, I have a bunch of metadata that's, that's a summarization of what's in my actual pages themselves. And I have to keep them in sync, but I actually can't guarantee that because the, the, the hardware can't guarantee that I can write two pages at exactly the same time. So let's say that, I delete a bunch of data here in my page, and then I update, I want to update my page directory and say, oh, I have this amount of free space. I may delete a bunch of data, write that out, and then before I can update my page directory and write that out, I crash. So now I come back online and say, oh, I, this, I think this page is full, and therefore I can't write any data to it, but I know it's actually not. Or in reality, it's not. So you could say, all right, well, when I boot back up, I'll just scan through all my pages and figure out what's actually really there. But now again, think, think, think in the extreme. If I have one gigabyte of data, then that's gonna take forever, or sorry, one petabyte of data, that's gonna take forever to actually do this. So there's a bunch of extra mechanisms we'll talk about later on for how we can maintain a log and initial metadata in, uh, in sort of special, fo special files so that if we crash and come back, we know how to reconstruct what's, what's inside of all these things. I think of this as just a hash table to say, I want page one, two, three, here's where to go find it, and my disk can get it. Yes? Uh, each page has the same size, right? Yes, each page, each page has the same size, yes. And this one's been specified differently in different systems? Or? What do you mean? Sorry, say it again? Uh, what's the size of the page? This question is, what is the size of a page in this world? Right, so this goes back to this diagram here. Uh, they do different, different systems do different things. Right? Well, the fail safe is the size of the page. Yeah, fail safe is like, you know, we can write four kilobytes and the hardware guarantee that's atomic. 
But now I need to write, you know, say, say my pages themselves are four kilobytes, but I need to update one page, say, clean out, clear out a bunch of data, update the page directory and say, all right, that, that page has been cleared out. I can't guarantee to write both of those pages atomically. I can write one crash before, before I write the second one. Okay. All right, so again, this is what the pages are gonna look like inside, yeah, sorry, in files. Then why some systems use bigger pages than four kilobytes? What's the advantage? So he says, why do some pages use, why do some data systems use larger pages? Uh, there's trade-offs. So internally, inside my database system, I have to have this page directory in memory. They're mapping pages to some, some location, either memory or on disk. But if now if I can represent a larger amount of data with one page ID, then that size of that table goes down. Think of this as like in the, the TLB, the translation local side buffer inside on the CPU. If I am trying to map to a bunch of pages, my, it's gonna, my page table is gonna get really large and I'm gonna, have, I'm gonna have cache misses. So by, you can represent more data in, you know, with, with few number of page IDs. Furthermore, going back to talking about the difference between random and sequential access. So now if I can write out contiguously, you know, say, say four, four kilobyte pages to represent a 16 kilobyte database page. When I do a read, I just read all that sequentially and bring it in. I, now I'm getting potentially more useful data that I need. But again, it, it, makes, more, it makes doing writes more expensive because I, now I have to stage a bunch of crap ahead of time to prevent myself from getting torn writes. So there's, there's pros and cons for both of them. And this is why, again, the commercial systems allow you to tune them in different ways based on what your application wants to do. That's a good question. Yes? So, so his question is for um, for self-contained pages. Would that solve this particular issue here? No, you still I mean so self-contained pages would mean like the contents of the inside the page. I have all the metadata that I need for it. I still have to have a page director to tell me where to find that page if I want page one, two, three, or four, five, six. So it's not entirely self-contained. At the, at the higher levels in the system, it's unavoidable at the bottom level, so what, where we're at here. Right? We, again, we haven't even talked about what's actually inside the, this, the page. But within the page directory, we, we can't guarantee that's self-contained. It doesn't make sense, right? Yes? Is there any way you can like, verify like, that, that like, you said like, you have like, the partial write, like you were trying to write 16 kilobytes, you write the first eight? Crash, don't write. Is there any way you can verify that that crash happened and like retry or something like that? Yeah, so his question is, is there any way to guarantee that the, uh, if a crash happens, when you come back, you can identify that the crash happened? Yes, so you do checksums, right? So say that I, I, my database page is these three pages here. In the header of the first page, I'll put a checksum and say, all right, the next, from, from my starting point here to the next three pages, the, the checksum should be like a CRC or MD5 should be this, this amount. So I come back online and I, after a crash, and I would look and say, oh, the last page when I, when I compute the checksum doesn't match because this thing didn't get written out. So then therefore I would know I, I have an error, right? And then we'll talk about logging in, no, in a second, but like you can log the operations you do to modify the pages. And that's essentially what the database system worries about mostly. All right. Cool. So let's uh, talk about what it actually looks like inside these pages. So again, every page is going to have a header, uh, and it's sort of what he asked about. We're going to have some information on what's the size of the page, the checksum, what database version or the, uh, the version of the software wrote this data out. Right? You, what can happen is people can, you know, database companies put out new releases, Postgres puts out new releases. Every single time, you know, the page layout may change. So when you, when you want to upgrade, you want to know, am I looking at pages that are created by the new software or the old software? And I can have different code paths to interpret them. If you're doing compression, like the dictionary compression, or like LZ4 or gzip, you can store information about that. We won't talk about this uh, at this point in the semester, but there's also information about you know, what transactions or what queries modify this data and whether other queries are allowed to see it. Again, and then we, we've, we've already talked about the issue of that they need to be self-contained. All right. So now within a page, we can represent data in, in two different ways. So we can do this as a sort of a tuple-oriented approach, and I'll explain what that, what that means in the next slide, uh, or we can do a, a log-structured approach. So again, it's, 
within a page now, assuming we have a page directory to tell us how we need to get to that page, if we want, you know, a particular page, one, two, three. Now we're talking about what does it look like when you look inside the page? What do you actually, what are the data system actually going to see? So for this one, let's just assume that we're storing tuples. And let's say a really simple case here, a really simple, you know, straw man idea is that in our page, all we're going to do is just insert tuples one after another. Right, start from the beginning, we have a little header space and say, here's the number of tuples that we have, so we know what offset we want to jump to if we, we, if we want to insert a new one. But you know, it's super simple, we just insert one at a time. Right? So let's say I insert, insert three tuples, assuming they're all fixed length. Every single time I insert one, I just jump to the next off, free offset, looking, and then update the counter. So this is a bad idea. Why? You delete tuple, you have to move everything below. Perfect. So he says if you have, if you delete a tuple, you have to move everything. Well, not necessarily, right? I could just do this, right? Free the space up. Internal, uh, external he says external fragmentation. Well, why? I, why can't I just insert in there? <laughs> <laughs> What's that? They can be of different sizes. Right? <laughs> right. So I made the assumption that they're fixed length size, but he's absolutely right. So this works great if, fixed, if everything's fixed length, because I just shove it the, the new one where the old one was. But if it's not fixed length, then this slot may actually, you know, this location may not be big enough for what I would insert, and now I've got to try to put it down in here, right? So, so that's one issue. I mean, the other issue, too, is like every single time I need to go say, I delete this thing, uh, I either need, need to main, ma maintain metadata at the top and tell me, hey, here's, the, here's, a, here's a location in this page where you can write some data, or I got to sequentially scan and look at every single tuple to figure out where I can go, right? So this sucks. Nobody does this. Instead, what you do is what are called slotted pages. So this is the most common scheme that every disk-oriented data system will use. The exact details of how they're going to represent these pages will be slightly different, but at a high level, this is this is what everyone does. So the way this is going to work, we're always going to have our header. The header again stores that basic metadata about checksum or you know access times and things like that. And then we're going to have two sort of regions of, of data we want to store. At the top, we're going to have what's called the slot array. And the bottom, we're actually going to have the actual the, the, the data we want to store. The, and again, we're assuming we're doing tuples here. So in this one, it can be fixed length or variable length tuples. It doesn't matter. So what the slot array basically is, is a mapping layer from a particular slot to some offset in the page where, where that's the starting location of the particular tuple that you want, right? And the reason why we, we want to have this indirection layer is because now we can start moving these within a page. We can move these tuples around any way that we want. And again, the upper levels of the system don't care, right? They can always, you know, the record ID is going to be the page ID and the slot number. And all they need to do is move these things around and just update the slot array and say, here's, here's where you're actually pointing to. And the way we're going to fill up the page is that the slot array is going to grow from the beginning to the end, and the data is going to grow from the end to the beginning. And at some point, we'll, they'll reach in the middle where we can't store any, any new information, and then that's where we say that our page is full. So yeah, this means that there could be a small little gap in the middle where we can't store anything, but that's, you know, because we want to support variable length tuples, we have to, we have to do this. Right, we could do what's called a vacuum or compaction. We could just scan through and reorganize our defragmentation in, in, in old file systems. We could do that in the background. The data can do it, but for our purposes, right? Th this is this is what we end up with. Yes. So here, are we assuming that a page can have tuples from uh, previous tables? If so how do we associate them with the table? Good point. So his question is: Are we assuming here that that the within a page we could have tuples from different tables? In practice, nobody does that. Because you would have to maintain some metadata to say this is from tuple one, from table one, this is from table two. We'll see at the end that there is a way to, there's some systems that do do this, but in, in, in general, nobody does this. Like if you open up SQLite or Postgres or whatever, you call create table, it'll create pages, and only tuples from those tables will go in those pages. It's a good question, we'll come to that in a second. So these are tuple oriented pages. Again, at the end of the day, we're trying to store tuples inside these pages. And so, you know, when I do an insert, I do an update, I want to find, you know, I take the contents of that tuple and just write it out in, in its entirety in this page here. Uh, we'll see in uh, next class, we'll talk about for really large data, like if you have attributes that's like you, you want to store like a, you know, a, a video file in the database, don't do that. We'll explain why later. But like 
for that case here, you couldn't store this because it won't fit in a single page. So you, some, you have some extra metadata and some pointers to say, here's the pages that have the, the rest of the data that you're looking for. But in general, we want to pack in the entire tuple in the single page, because now when we go access that, need to access the tuple, it's one page read to go get it. And not, not a bunch of different ones. Again, we'll break that assumption in the next class, but for our purposes here, uh, it's fine. So another way to store data in pages is, is, is there a question? Oh, yeah. All right, so his question is, say I remove the third tuple here, right? What happens? Well, it depends. I'll give a demo at the end of the class. Some systems will actually compact it before it writes out the disk. Some systems will just leave the gap here. And then if it, if it gets full and you say, oh, I have some free space, maybe I try to do compaction. Yes? Uh, for this slide, um, so the slot points to the starting position. Obviously. Yes. So does it write this way or this way? So his question is, the, the slot is pointing to the starting position of the tuple. And the question is what? Does it point? What's the order of the uh, tuple starting like, inside the thing? Like, going from higher address to lower address or lower to higher? So this question is what is the, what is the, sh the ordering of the storage address within the slots? No, with, uh, within the tuple, yeah. So does it like, allocate this much and from high, lower to higher or does it go from higher to lower? I'm not sure. I, I, I'm not sure what you mean. Like, I have, say, this is four kilobytes. Okay. I, I want to store a one kilobyte tuple for tuple one. So from starting from the offset, I jump to the one kilobyte, and then my slot array points to that. Oh, okay. Right. <coughs> yes. The question is, if I delete one tuple in the middle, again I delete tuple three, <laughs> what do I what do I do up above? Nothing. In the slot array. Then do you keep track of the where three? Yeah. So again, the header could like, different systems do different things. The header could could have like a bitmap and say, you know, here's the here's the slots that are empty that you could put, point something in, or I could just sequential scan and read it. Right? It, it doesn't matter. The key thing, though, I think, is that the the upper parts of the system don't know and don't care that where I'm actually physically stored. Like for so for tuple one, right? This comes out of this slot here, right? So in the upper part of the system, it would say. Oh, tuple one, you can find it if you have page one, two, three at slot zero or slot one, depending on what your starting offset is. So now, no matter how I reorganize my page and move tuple one around, I know that I always want to go to the first slot to find where it's actually located. And now if I reorganize, I don't have to update my indexes, I don't have to update anything. And this is sort of what the, the, the page directory is trying to do as well. So no matter where I move the pages on, 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 on the file, Either on disk or you know different you know, on, on the network, other parts of the system don't care where it actually got moved to because I have a page one two three, I, you know I have the page ID I can always use the page directory to find where it's actually being stored. Right, these indirection layers avoid having to have uh, updates propagate through all the parts of the system. Yes. Uh, can you explain then how um, you exactly know that like tuple one is stored exactly at which um, slot? So this question is how do I know that tuple one is stored in like slot one in slot one. So I don't know, jump ahead too much, but we'll go ahead and just do that. So I, th this is always the last slide, but I'll just talk about it now. So the way we identify tuples is through these record IDs or tuple IDs, uh, and it's essentially a unique identifier to say here's the uh, like a logical location or a logical address of a of a tuple. Um, it's a blend of logical and physical, but it's usually the page ID and like the offset or the slot. So other parts of the system that want to address tuple one, right? They don't know what tuple one is. They just know I have a page ID and I'm a slot number. And so I go to the page directory and say I want page one two three. The page directory says oh it's in this file at this offset. Jump to that. Then I get I get to that page. Now I say, oh, I want slot one. I look at my slot array, and that tells me where in that page to go find the data that I want. So other parts of the system, like the indexes, uh, log records, and other things, they're going to address tuples through these record IDs. So it's like separate from the page. What do you mean separate from the page? Like, basically, you just said you basically have to like go through it. It tells you what page it's in, and yeah. like, the, or, like what slot it's in as well. Yes. So that information. This record is kept separate from 
I mean, it, it like, I'll give a demo. Hopefully, hopefully this makes more sense. Like, say I want to find find the, the salary, find the, the student record or the professor record, the name Andy. I look in the index on the name, and it's going to say, oh, there's a professor named Andy, and he's he has a record ID of page 123, offset, slot 1. That's what the index gives me. So then I say, go to the page directory. Okay, give, where do I find page 123? Go get it for me. It goes and gets it. Now I have the pointer to the page and say, oh, I want slot one. I look at my slot array and that tells me what offset to jump to that page to find what I need. Okay. Right? And so different data systems do different things. The most common approach is the page ID and, and the slot number, the offset. And again, the advantage of this is that if I start moving data around, either moving the page around or moving data within the page itself, the index and all the other crap doesn't have to get updated because they're still looking at page one, two, three, offset one. So, again, let me, I'll give a demo that explains a little more detail. So, in different systems, do different things. Like in Postgres, it'll be four, four bytes. Oracle is 10 bytes. There's a bunch of extra metadata that they store. And SQLite is it's eight bytes. So, let's give a demo because uh, that's always fun. Um, because I hate typing on the surface, I'm going to use my other laptop. And I can see it better. All right, so I'm just gonna give an example again of what, of how we can actually see what these pages look like. Because again, the data system st stores this internally. You're not supposed to see it, but there's different commands to do to actually to get at it. Like, can everyone in the back see that or is that too dark or too light? Is that better? Okay. All right, so we're gonna make a, um, we're gonna make a simple table um, that has two columns, ID and value, and we're going to insert some tuples in it. All right? So this is Postgres. All right? So you see ID and value. So Postgres has this thing called the CTID that is represents the physical location of the data. Of the data. So I can add this like virtual column here, a CTID, and I get it in my output. So this now is a tuple, or a pair, that's going to have the page ID and the offset. So again, here's the data. I started three tuples. So now it's saying that at page 0, slot 1 is the first tuple. Page 0, slot 2 is the second tuple. Page 0, slot 3 is the third tuple. Right? So, this can, so it's not actually storing this data. It's just, it can derive this when it runs the query because it says, oh, I, I look at my page. I see the slots. Here's the tuples that actually are actually found. Right? So let's go ahead and delete one of these tuples. Let's say, say I delete the, the second one. So I go back and look at my tuple, or look, look, look at my data, and you can see that it deleted the, the second tuple, but it didn't reorganize the page, right? The, the, the third tuple is still at you know, page zero offset three, or slot three, all right? So let's say now I go insert a new tuple in. What do you think it's gonna do? What's that? What, what, so, I, again, I, I had a, I deleted the second tuple. Now I have, a, I have a tuple at slot one and slot three. I insert a new tuple. Is it going to be slot two or slot four? Raise your hand if you say slot two. Half. Slot three. Or sorry, slot four. Less. Slot four. Right? It's not wrong, right? Because for our purposes, the relational model doesn't say anything about the order of how we insert tuples. Postgres, the way it's implemented, decided to put it at the end. So Postgres has this thing called the vacuum. Think of this again as like the garbage collector uh, for, my, for, for, for the database. So it's going to go through and reorganize all the pages. Um, and it actually may take a while, so we'll come back to that. But when it does this, it's going to then say, oh, well, I know that I have a, uh, I have a free space in two, so I'm going to compact the pages and write them out sequentially. All right, it's gonna take a while. Let's, let's look at other ones. So we can do uh, SQL Server. Same thing. I have um, I have three tuples. Actually, let me drop the table and start over. So now I, I have three tuples. Select star from R. Right? One, two, three. 
So Postgres does, uh, sorry, SQL Server doesn't have the CTID. It has this uh, like other built-in function like this. And it tells you, here's the file ID, here's the page number, and here's the slot, 0, 1, 2, OK? So let's do the same thing. Let's delete a tuple, insert a new one. Well, yeah, we can look at the old one querying, and it didn't, it didn't compact it. It still says you know, uh, 0, 1. Actually, no, I did compact it. Sorry, take that back. Let's start do this over again. I missed that, sorry. <laughs> I always forget which one do, does it correctly or not. Or not, not again, it's not correct. It's which one does it that way? So we insert three tuples, do a select, right? Zero, one, two. Now I delete the, the, the second tuple. Do the same select. Oh, it did zero, or zero, two. I did, didn't compact it, sorry. <laughs> Let's insert another one again. Zero, one, two. So, so, so this, so this was the, 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 the second tube. This was two. Now it's one. It made this two. Because what it did is it says, when it updated the page, it says, oh, I have a free space. Let me compact it and, and write it out. Right? Again, from the higher level part of the system, it, we don't know. We don't care. Internally, it can do whatever it wanted. So going back to Postgres, um, what is it, one? Postgres. When we inserted the new tuple, I put it at the end, but then I run the vacuum, and that does basically compaction. All right now it reorganizes 0, 1, 3. 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, where that was 1, 3, 4. Right? So the last one I want to show is uh, Oracle. And although Oracle is sponsored in the class, I will just say this their terminal sucks. Uh, <laughs> you, like, you can't hit up, there's no way to go back and. Um, Drop table R. Let's create a table. And you can't, you can't, so this is the nice shortcut. Like every data system allows you to do inserts. Like one insert query, and then once the commas are separated, insert them all at once. Oracle doesn't let you do that. So I have to go do one by one. <laughs> so Oracle has something called a row ID. Again, so this is an internal thing. That Oracle's maintaining. Uh, you, you know, if you, you normally run queries, you don't see this, but if you just add the row ID column, it's like an you know, internal virtual column, it exposes this information. So this is some 10 byte gibberish. Right? We, we, we don't know how to interpret this. So there is a command, there's a bunch of functions you can run. Again, I, I found this on the internet, I didn't write this, uh, to basically decipher this, and now you get like here's the file number, the block number, and the row slot, the same way we saw for, for, for SQL Server. Okay? Let's do that. Let's let's delete the second guy um, and go back. Oh, can't do that. <laughs> so it was uh, zero one two for the slots, and now it's still at zero two. Let's go insert our, our new tuple. All right. So who says it's going to be uh, at slot one? Two, okay. Who says it's, it's going to be slot four or slot three? Even less. Nobody knows. Okay. <laughs> slot three. Right? So, again, the main two. SQL Server compacted the page before it wrote it back out. Oracle and Postgres just leave, leave the empty slot there. Okay? Again, it doesn't matter to the other parts of the system. This is just something how the, the, the system is internally organizing uh, tuples or slots within the pages. OK. So let's go back. All right, so did that answer your question? I realized that was a long. Yeah. OK. Good. Yeah. <laughs> so let's talk about now, um, how are we doing on time? Yes? Why expose this API to the user? question is, why do you expose this API to the user? So <sighs> database systems are very complex pieces of software. People get paid a sh** money to maintain them. Uh, and so by exposing all the metadata you can to the end user, like administrator, 
it just it, it, it could potentially hyper help them decipher why it's doing certain things. That's what I would say. But it, you don't want to write your application using any of this. It's not reliable, right? Um, let's use Postgres because I know how to do Postgres. Oh, so going back to this, so Postgres again, we, we've already done the compaction with the vacuum, but Postgres will actually let you do this. You can say where uh, CT ID. Let me put it at the top. Sorry. Where CT ID <laughs> equals, and then zero one. Right. So I can access the tuple exactly based on its like storage location. I don't want to do this in my application because again, at any time. The data system is allowed to reorganize it, and I could end up with a different CIT ID. So it's unique. I, you know, I could uniquely identify a tuple, but I don't want to do that because it'll, I, I could get screwed up. I get, I think the answer is in it's just exposing the internals of the system to, to allow administrators to understand what's going on. Yes. So what happens if you like columns or something that's like main CIT ID like table? Boom. His question is, what happens if you have a. Uh, if you, if you try to name a column with that, or might try to name a table with that. Let's see that. So drop table XXX, create table XXX, ID int, CT ID int. Let's, who says it'll, it'll be allowed to do this? Yes or no? Raise your hand, yes. Raise your hand, no. Yes, you can't do that. Uh, let's try Oracle. Create table xxx, id int, row id int. Nope, didn't like it. So, yes, it's a reserved name. There's a bunch of other things you can't, like, I can't name a, actually, can, let's see if I can, if I can name a column. Uh, oh, this is SQLite, sorry. SQL Server, Postgres, all right. So let's try create table. Like you can't name a column int, I don't think. Oh, you can. <laughs> different systems do different things. Um, yeah. Okay. Don't do that. That's a, that's a bad idea. All right. Uh, how are we doing on time? So. So we're short on time, so let me quickly talk about tuple layouts, um, and then that'll set, set us up what we're, what we're talking about uh, for, for next class. Um, so a tuple in our world is just, just a sequence of bytes, right? It, we, just, we, 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 we get a slot offset, we just write a bunch of se sequence of bytes, and we're done. And so it's the job for the data system to, to be able to interpret what those bytes actually mean. Again, and that's where the schema comes in. So the schema is going to say, I have an int, it's 32 bits, I have an int that's 64 bits. So when I look at my, 60, my, 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 my sequence of bytes, I know how to jump to different offsets to find the columns that I want. Right? So again, it just looks like this. In our tuple, again, this is like the starting location within an offset within our page. We'll have a header. So we can keep track of different things, like what, whether, you know, what, what transaction or query modify this. And then we'll have the, the actual, you know, the metadata about things like whether we have null values, and then are actually tuples. So we typically don't need to store the metadata about the tuple within the tuple itself, right? So, so when we store a tuple, we don't need to say, hey, I have four columns and they're of this type. We store that in a higher level metadata information either within the page or within the catalog pages themselves. You have to do this in uh, in like JSON databases or schemaless databases like MongoDB because every single tuple, every single record could be different, every document could be different. So you have to store what met the metadata about what is actually inside of it. So the inside the tuple data itself, uh, you typically store them in the order that you created the table. So if I say you know create table A B C D E, I'll just usually most systems just store it in the order that, that they happen. Right, that, that we got created. You don't have to, relational model says you don't have to do this, but typically most systems do this. If you get talking about sort of, you know, in memory systems that are trying to be cache efficient, uh, you can reorder this so that you're word aligned uh, for cache lines, but for our purposes, we don't care, right? So the last thing I wanna talk about was his question before about storing data from different tables inside the same page. And I said, most systems don't do this. And the, 
the reason it like the reason why you don't want to do this is because uh, again, if you want the things to be self-contained, you don't want a bunch of extra metadata about these different tables. Where it does show up is when you denormalize tables or pre-join tables. So we're not talking about normal forms or functional dependencies in this class. You don't know it yet, but you'll thank me when you're older because they're terrible. People cry every single time we try to teach them. Most database classes teach them. I don't think they're important. Uh, I, nobody does this in reality, in the practice. Maybe some DBAs do, but, but almost nobody does. So for that reason, you know, when I first taught this class, we, we did two whole lectures on normal forms. You, we don't need to do that. You just need to know what they exist, that they that it exists, and what it means. So that that's what this one slide is. So we're going to encapsulate two lectures in one slide. Okay. So normalization is basically how we split up our, our our database across different tables, and this sort of naturally happens when you have foreign keys. Like I have artists and and albums, I could have you know foreign keys sort of break them up, um, and so we do this sort of it happens naturally as we design our application. Now there's some cases where we actually want to embed one table inside of another, right? If, if we want to avoid the overhead of maybe doing a join, we can just say, here's all the albums that an artist put out. We just inline them in, in, in its own tuple. And in that case, within a single page, we could have data from two different tables packed in the same, side of the same page. So let's look at a really simple example. I have two tables, foo and bar. Bar has a foreign key dependency reference to the, the foo table. So normally I would store my tuples like this. I would store them uh, it's completely separate. All the data for the bar table is stored in, in its page, and all the data for the food table is stored in this page. But if most of the time if I'm trying to join these two tables together, for every query I want to join these two tables together, right? Get me all the foos for, give me all the bars for a given foo. Then maybe what I want to do is just embed the bar tuples directly inside of the foo tuple. So now, if you go back here, like I had, I had, I was, I was replicating the, um, the 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 a attribute for every single bar tuple, but now if I pack it inside of it, I don't need to repeat it. I just have the, 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 the columns that are unique for that other table, right? So this is called denormalization. Another way to think about it is like pre-joining. I'm packing tuples inside of each other. I can either do this logically by rewriting my application and creating tables that way, or I can do this physically, which is what we care about here. And underneath the covers, we're, we're storing our pages like this. The application can still tell us, hey, I have two, two separate tables. But underneath the covers in our pages, we'll actually combine them and pack them together. All right? So this is the only time I think that systems actually try to store data from two different tables inside the same tuples. Okay? This is not a new idea. It's super old. It goes back to the 1970s. IBM first invented this when they invented the first database system, system R, the first relational database system at, at, at IBM. Uh, but it turned out to be a huge pain to maintain in the software. And then they abandoned it when they went off and made DB2. So System R was the first relation, one of the first relational databases that are out there, but they never commercialized it and they never sold it. But they took up some of the code in the 1980s and created DB2, which is still around today. And so it actually is showing up in more modern systems today. So if you get uh, Cloud Spanner from Google, right, if you have it, when you define your proto, proto buffs API, you can actually pack in, it'll pack in the, the two different tables together in the same tuple. There was a startup a long time ago, 10 years ago, called Akaban that basically sold a storage engine for MySQL that did this kind of denormalization automatically. They got bought by Foundation DB, and then Foundation DB got bought by Apple. Uh, so Akaban doesn't exist anymore. And then a bunch of these document databases or JSON databases are essentially doing the same thing. Right? When you define your JSON document, you can pre-join and pack in uh, related attributes within the, the JSON document itself. And that's essentially doing the same thing. Okay, so again, that's the only time people actually store tuples from different tables inside the same pages. Okay, so we covered this and we're done. All right, so again, what do we talk about today? Databases are organized in pages. There's different ways to track the pages that are in our files. And then within those pages, we can store them in different ways and we store our tuples inside the, the, the pages differently. So for the first assignment, first programming project, we will already take care of the page layout for you. Right, so well, and we've already written the disk manager for you. It's when we get into the second project, you're actually going to have to define what the page layout is for your, your, for your index that you're going to build. Okay? So next class, we'll talk about how to actually represent values inside the tuples. So we'll go in, now inside of the, the byte sequences for tuples. We'll talk about what, what, what the single attributes look like. 
And then we'll talk about storage models. How are we actually going to represent uh, how we organize tuples within a, within a table itself. All right? Any questions? Yes? Her question is, which is an awesome question, what does test-driven development look like for databases? How do I know I'm running queries correctly? Huge topic. Let's talk about it afterwards. Okay. That's, I'm extremely interested in that. I'm actually trying to hire somebody full-time to do that for us. It's hard. <laughs> if you can do testing for database systems, I can get you a job yesterday. Okay? Not just me, like in Silicon Valley. After you've collected a bunch of data in the OHP side, now you want to start analyzing it to extrapolate new information. Like, people in the city of Pittsburgh are more, more likely to buy this kind of product. Right? So that you can use that information to then you know, push information to the OTP side to get people to do things you want them to do. And then the hybrid transaction analytical processing, HTAP workloads, this is sort of a new buzzword that Gartner invented uh, a, a few years ago, basically describing these database systems that try to do uh, both of them. So a typical setup you'll see often is like this. You have your front-end OTP da databases, and then you have your giant back-end data warehouse. So these are sometimes called data silos because you can do a bunch of updates into the sort of one database instance, uh, whether it's a single node or distributed, it doesn't matter. But it's a single logical database. And then uh, you apply all your changes here, but they don't really communicate with each other. Each one is, is sort of a, an island by itself. So then you're going to do what's called extract, transform, and load, or ETL. And this is sort of a, the, the term you use to describe taking data out of these front ends, cleaning it up, processing it, and then putting it to the backend data warehouse. So the example I like to give for this is like Zynga, uh, the Farmville people, they buy a lot of gaming startups. And then when they buy them, they all run their own front end OLTP databases. But then when they want to put it in their backend giant data warehouse, so they can do analyze things to make you buy crap on Farmville better, right? And so because, say, like in one database, the first name of a customer will be F name, another database will be, you know, F first underscore name, right? So it's the same concept or same entity, just with different, different uh, uh, syntax and nomenclature. So this ETL process cleans all that up. You shove it to your data warehouse, you do all your analytics here, and then whatever new information you have, you push it to the front, all right? And then when you see things like people that bought this item also bought this item, that's, that they're doing that on the OLAP side and then they shove it to the front end to expose that through the OHP application. So HTAP basically says, let's just also do some of the analytical queries that we can normally only do on the OLAP side. We can do it on the front end data silos. You still want this giant thing, your giant data warehouse, because you want to be able to, to, to look at all your data silos put, to, put together. But now, instead of waiting for things to be propagated to the back end, you can do some things on the front end. So that's basically what HTAP is. So again, this could be like your MySQL, this is your Postgres. MongoDB, whatever you want. And then your backend data warehouse would be Hadoop stuff, Spark, uh, Greenplum, Vertica, you know, those, those large enterprise data warehouse systems, or Redshift, or Snowflake, or other uh, cloud ones. OK, so is this clear? OK, so the main topic today we're going to talk about is now, given that we've already spent uh, two previous lectures on deciding how we're actually going to represent uh, the database in, on disk, now we want to talk about what we actually do to bring that database from those files on disk, the pages on disk, and bring them into memory so that we can operate on them, right? So remember that we, the database system can't operate directly on disk. We can't do reads and writes without having to bring it to memory first. That, that's the von Neumann architecture. Now, there are some new hardware coming out that you can push execution logic down to the disks, but we, we can ignore that for now. So we're trying to figure out how do we want to bring that, those pages into disk, and we want to do this and be able to support a database that exceeds the amount of memory that we have. And we want to minimize the impact or the slowdown or the, imp the problems of having queries have to touch data on disk. We want to make it appear as if everything's in memory. So another way to think of the problem is, is, is also in terms of spatial versus temporal control. So spatial control is you know, where are we physically going to write this data on disk, right? Meaning like we, w we know that these pages are going to be used together often, possibly one after another. So when we write those pages out, we want to write them sequentially so that when we go read them again, they'll be, they'll be you know, right in, uh, physically close to each other, and we don't have to do long seeks to find different spots on disk. We also care about temporal control, and this is where we make decisions about when do we read pages into memory, like what time we do this, and then at some point we have to write it back out if it's been written if it, or if it's been modified, and we want to make a decision of when we actually go ahead and do that. 
And again, this is the overarching goal of can, trying to minimize the number of stalls we have because our queries try to read data that we didn't have in memory and we had to write up, you know, that, that was out on disk, we had to go fetch it. So this is the overall architecture of the lower store manager that I showed in the beginning. So we've sort of covered this part already. So we, now we know how to have a database file or files on disk. We know how to represent the page directory to find the data we need. And then we have a bunch of pages, it's a lot of pages, log structure pages, it doesn't matter. We have a bunch of pages out on disk and we know how to jump to them to find them. So now we're talking about this part up here, the buffer pool, right? When something else in the system, like the execution engine, the thing executing queries comes along and says, I want to read page two. We got to know how to fetch the page directory into memory, figure out what's in there, and then go find the, the page that we want and fetch that into memory. And then the tricky thing is going to be, if we don't have enough space, don't have free memory to bring that page we need in, we have to make a decision what page to write out. So that's, you know, th this is what we're trying to solve today. Right, and then the, the other parts of the system don't need to know or really care about what's, you know, what's in memory, what's not in memory. They're just going to wait until you get the thing that you need and then give you back a pointer to let you do whatever it is that you wanted to do. Okay? So the things we're talking about today is essentially just how to build or what a buffer pool manager actually is going to do. Uh, in some, I'm going to use the term buffer pool manager. Some systems will call this a buffer cache. It's, it's the same thing. Right? It's memory managed by, by the database system. Then we'll talk about how we actually can do uh, different policies to decide what, you know, what pages we want to write out the disk, what pages if we need to free up space, what additional optimizations we can do to, to minimize this impact. And then we'll finish up talking about some other pieces of the database system that may need memory. Okay? So again, the buffer pool is essentially just a large memory region that we're going to allocate inside of our database system. We're going to call malloc, and we're going to get some chunk, chunk of memory. And that's where we're going to put all our pages that we fetch from disk. And so this is, again, this is all entirely managed by the memory, uh, by the database system, other than having go to the operating system and ask for the memory, right? We have to use malloc. There's, we can't just malloc or allocate memory on our own. So we, the OS is going to provide us this. But then we're going to break up this memory region into fixed size or page size chunks called frames. And this is, you know, frame seems kind of unusual. Why don't I just say page or block or whatever? But there's so many different terms in, in database systems to, to roughly describing the same thing. So frames correspond to slots in the, or see, I use the term slot, I'm going to use that. Frames correspond to regions or chunks in the buffer pool reg memory region that we can put pages in, right? And we, slot is the thing we put things into pages within for tuples. So for buffer pool, it's, it's frames. For on the page, it'll be slots. So. What happens is when the database system calls, makes a request and say, I want a page, right? We're going to look to see whether it's already in our, in our buffer pool. If not, then we go out in the disk, make a copy of it, and fetch, fetch it in, put it into memory. So this is a straight one-to-one -one copy. We're not doing any deserialization, right? We, we can ignore compression for now, but whatever, how, however it's represented on disk is exactly how it'll be represented in memory. We're not doing any marshalling of the data. We just take, take it from the disk and put it directly into memory. All right, and we keep doing this for all, all the other pages that, that, that we may need. All right? So the, in my earlier example, when I, when I showed how the execution engine says, hey, I want a page two, right? It magically, you know, Buffer Pool Manager magically figured out what page two is. So in our, if, if we're just organizing these things as frames, uh, the pages can go in any order in the frames that they want, right? <laughs> In this case here, even though it's page one, page one, two, three, in my buffer pool, it's page one, three. It's not in the same order that it's out on disk. So we need an, an extra indirection layer above this to figure out if I want a particular page, what frame has the one I want. Because it's not going to match exactly in the same order that it is on disk. So this is what the page table is. The page table is just a hash table that's going to keep track of what pages we have in memory. And if you ask for a particular page ID, it'll tell you what frame that, it, that it's located, located in, right? And so the database system is going to have to maintain some, some additional metadata to keep track of what, what's going on with the pages that it currently has in, in its buffer pool. So the first thing we got to keep track of is called the dirty flag. And this is just a flag, a single bit, that tells us whether the page has been modified since it's been read from, from disk. Like, did some query, some transaction make a change to it? The other thing we got to keep track of also is uh, what we call a pin counter or a reference counter. And this is just keeping track of the number of threads or queries that are currently running that want this page to remain in memory. Meaning we don't, we don't want it written out to disk. Right? It could be because I'm, I'm going to update it, 
So I do my fetch, I go fetch the page I need, bring it to my buffer pool, then I'm going to go ahead and go ahead and modify it. I don't want that page to get evicted or swapped out back at the disk in between the time it's been brought in and before I can actually do my update to it. This also is going to prevent us from evicting pages that uh, have not been safely written back to disk yet. All right. So again, so like I could pin a page and say I, I don't want this thing uh, in uh, to ever be, ever be removed from the buffer pool for now, and then say I'm reading a page here. Uh, sorry, I want to read a page that's not currently in memory. I want to put a latch on this, this entry in the hash table so that I can go fetch the page and then update the page table to not point to it, right? And I have to do this because multiple threads can be running at the same time. I can't assume that I'm the only person looking at the page table, so I want to prevent somebody else from taking this, this entry in my page table, and while I'm fetching the page that I need, they come and steal it from me and put something else in, all right? So again, there's, we'll see this as we go along later in the semester, but there's a bunch of extra stuff we have to do to keep track of what pages have been modified. So the dirty bit is just sort of one piece of it. We also need to keep track of who actually made the modification. So because we, we, if we want to write a log record to say, here's the change that was made, we want to make sure that log record's written first before a page is written. Right, this is another example why MMAP is a bad idea, because I can't guarantee the operating system is not going to write my page out the disk before I want it to. Because right, it doesn't, doesn't prevent you from doing that. At least on Linux, FreeBSD can let you do this, but Windows and, and Linux don't, don't let you prevent this. All right, so is this clear what we're trying to do here? Right? Basically managing our own memory, but we're keeping track of how the transactions or queries are modifying the, the pages, and we have to protect ourselves in the page table to prevent anybody else from you know, evicting things or overwriting stuff before we're done with, uh, with what we want to do. Any questions? Okay, so I need to make a very important distinction now about the difference between locks and latches. So this will come up later on. This, you'll have to do this for the first project as well. Um, if you're coming from an operating system background, in, in their world, a lock is what we call a latch. So in, in, in the, uh, uh, let me just describe both of them in the context of databases, and I'll, see, I'll describe how they map into the OS world. So a lock in, data, in the database world is some higher level logical primitive that's going to protect the contents of the database, the logical contents, like a tuple, a table, a database. Right? And the transaction is going to hold this lock for its duration while it's running, which means could could be multiple queries. Right? This could be you know, multiple milliseconds or multiple seconds even, or even, even minutes or hours as if, if it's a really long running query. So in that world, again, this is something that the database system is going to provide to us and expose to uh, you as like the application programmer. You, you can see what locks are being held for as you run queries. Latches are the low-level protection primitives that we use for the critical sections of the internals of the database system, like protecting, uh, protecting data structure, protecting regions of memory. And so for these, these latches we're going to hold for just the duration of the operation that we're making. Like if I go update my page table, I take a latch on the entry on, on the, the, the the location of that I'm going to modify, make the change, and then I release the latch. All right, and we're not, we don't need to worry about rolling back any changes in the same way we do for, for locks because it's, you know, it's, it's an internal thing, like updating the physical data structure of the database system, I make the change, and if I can't actually get the latch that I want, then I just abort and, and don't worry about rolling back. Yes? What does rolling back mean in this context? Okay, so he says rolling back changes. This will come later on when we talk about currency control, but basically say like, um, I want to take money out of my bank account and put it in your bank account. So we take money out of my bank account, but then the system crashes before I put the money in your account. I want to roll back the change I made to my account because I don't want to lose that money. That's what I mean by that. Right, this, we'll, we'll discuss the whole lecture on concurrent control. It's awesome, trust me. Uh, but for now, the main thing, we're focused on this thing here. Right? So again, in the operating system world, this would, a latch would be something like a mutex. We're actually going to use mutexes in, in our database system to protect the critical sections of things. So I will try to be very careful and always say latch when I mean latch, but occasionally I slip up and we'll use lock. But I, if it's, a, it's an internal thing, we mean latch. It's also very confusing too, because the mutex implementation you would use to protect you for as a latch is called a spin lock, all right? But it's really you know, this thing and not this thing, okay? All right. So the other th distinction we want to make is the difference between the page directory and the page table. So remember, the page directory is 
what we're going to use to figure out where to find pages in our file. So we want page one, two, three. It'll tell us what file at what offset or you know, what, what set of files have, have what we're looking for. So all the changes we're going to make to the page directory have to be durable. They have to be written back to the disk because if we crash and come back, we want to know where to find the pages that we have. The page table is an internal in-memory map that just maps page IDs to where the, the frames that they are in, in the buffer pool. So this thing can be entirely ephemeral, and we don't need to back it by disk because if we crash and come back, our buffer pool is blown away anyway, so who cares? So this, the, the page directory has to be durable. The, the, the page table does not, does not have to be. And that means we can just use whatever your favorite hash map or hash table implementation you want. Right? For project one, you just use STD, STD map. That's fine. Uh, because again, we don't have to worry about this thing being uh, durable. We have to make sure it's thread safe, certainly, but not, not durable. All right. So now when we start talking about how we want to allocate memory in our database uh, for the buffer pool, we, will, we can start to think about this in, in two different ways. So the first is that we can choose what are called sort of global policies, where we're trying to make decisions that benefit the entire workload that we're trying to, to, trying to execute. Right, we look at all the queries, all the transactions that are going on in the system, and we try to say, at this point in time, what's the right thing I should do for choosing what should, should be in memory versus not in memory? An alternative is to use a local policy where on, for each single query or each single transaction we're running, we try to say, what's the best thing to do to make my one query or one transaction go faster, even though for the, for the, uh, the global system, that actually might be a bad, a bad choice. So, the, there's no one way that's better than another. Obviously, there's optimization you, you can do if you have a global view versus a local view, but then for each individual query, you might be, be more tailored to what they want to do to make that run faster. So as we've seen in much of these examples as we go along for optimizations, the most systems will probably try to do a combination of the two of them. What you'll be implementing for the first project will, will, is considered a global policy because it's just looking at you know, what's the least recently used page and, and removing that even though that may be bad for one particular query. All right, so that's basically all you really need to know about how to build a buffer pool, right? It's just, you have a page table that maps page IDs to frames, and then you look in the, the offset in your in the, the, the allocated memory, and that tells you, that here's the page that you were looking for. Seems pretty simple, right? So now we wanna talk about how to actually make this thing be super awesome or super uh, tailored for the application that, that we're trying to run or the workload we're trying to run inside of our database system. And this is going to allow us to do certain things that the operating system can't do because it doesn't know anything about what kind of queries you're running. It doesn't know what data they're touching, what are they going to touch next, right? So now we can talk about what we can do to make, make this thing do better than what sort of a naive scheme would do. So we'll talk about how to handle multiple buffer pools, prefetching, scan sharing, and then the, the last one would be buffer pool bypass. Okay. So in my example that I showed, I referred to the buffer pool as a single entity. Right, the data system has one buffer pool. In actuality, you can have multiple buffer pools. So you can have multiple regions of memory you've allocated. They each have their own page table. They each have their own then mapping to, uh, from page IDs to, to frame IDs or frames. Right? And the reason why you want to do this is now you can have for each buffer pool, you can actually have you know, the, the, a local policy for that buffer pool that's tailored for whatever is the data that you're putting into it. You know, so for example, I could have a... Uh, a single buffer pool for each table. Because maybe some tables I'm doing a bunch of sequential scans, and some tables I'm doing uh, point queries where I'm jumping to single pages at a time. And I can have different caching policies or different replacement policies to decide based on the two workload types. Right? I can't do that easily if it's a giant, just a giant a buffer pool. Well, let's say I, have an, I can have a buffer pool for an index, a buffer pool for tables, and then they have different access patterns, and then I can have different policies for each of those. The other big advantage you also get is that it's going to end up reducing latch contention for the different threads that are trying to access it, right? So when I do that lookup in the page table, I have to take a latch on the entry that I'm looking at as I go find the, the frame that has the data that I want. And I want to make sure that nobody else swaps that out what, but, you know, from the time I do the lookup from the time I go get the, the page that I want. And so that means that I could have a bunch of threads all contending on the same latch because they're all accessing the same page table. So no matter how many cores I have on my brand new machine, I'm not getting uh, good scalability because everything's contended on, on, on these, uh, these critical sections. But now if I just have multiple page tables, 
the, each thread, you know, they could be accessing different page, different page tables at the same time, and therefore they're not contending on those latches, and now I, I get better scalability. Now, still could be still bottlenecked on the disk speed, which is always a big problem. But at least internally now, I'm not worried about them, you know, trying to all acquire the same latch. So, this is something you see mostly in the enterprise or expensive database systems. So, Oracle DB2, Sybase, and Formix, uh, uh, SQL Server, all support this ability to have multiple buffer pools. DB2, you can do all sorts of crazy things. You can create multiple, multiple buffer pools. You can assign them to different tables. You can have different caching policies for all, for all of them. You can set them to be different page sizes. Um, my SQL, even though it's open source, actually has this as well. It's, it's not that as sophisticated. You just say how many buffer pool instances you want, and then they just do round robin hashing to decide what, what uh, you know, if you forgive in page ID, where, where, where is the data that I'm looking for? What buffer pool has it? So there's two ways to, to use these things, right? To, to map the thing that you're looking for to a buffer pool that has the page that, uh, that you want. Right? So typically what happens is if you have multiple buffer pools, you can't have a page in one, you know, in, in buffer pool one this time, but then when you fetch it back the disk later on, it comes in another one. It always wants to be in the same location, so you know how, you know how to find it quickly. So the first approach is that you can actually extend the record ID to now include additional metadata about what database object this buffer pool is managing. So if you recall, when we looked at the uh, record IDs of, of, of Oracle and SQL Server, they had extra columns, extra information that Postgres didn't have. Like Postgres had the page and the slot number. Oracle had like the, the object number, page number, and, and then a slot number. So we could use that, that additional object number to then have another map that says, all right, for object you know, XYZ, you can, it's, in this, it's in this buffer pool or that buffer pool. Right, so now the requests from, from upper levels of the system are saying, give me, you know, give me record one, two, three, and I know how to, how to split that up and find out the, what object it corresponds to and what buffer pool will maintain that data. For the hashing approach, again, I think this is what MySQL does. It's pretty simple. You just take the record ID, you hash it and mod n by the number of, of buffer pools you have, and that just tells you where, where, where to go get the data that you want. Right, and this, you can do this really, really quickly, really fast. It's not an expensive operation. Actually, for either of those, it's not an expensive operation. All right, the next optimization we can do is to do prefetching. So the idea here is that, again, we want to minimize the stalls in the data system due to having to go to disk to read data. So if we start doing like a scan and our buffer pool is empty, this query wants to read page zero. Page zero is not in memory, not in our buffer pool. So we have to stall that thread until we go out the disk, fetch it, and then put it into our buffer pool. Then when, once it's in our buffer pool, then we hand back the pointer to the upper levels of the system and say, the page you wanted is now here in, in, our, in our memory. Go do whatever it is that you want to do. So the way to think about this is like, it's a, you can th think of this arrow as like a cursor. So internally, the database system is going to keep track of uh, this, this thing called a cursor. Like As you iterate over every single page for, that your query needs, you just know where you left off the last time. So when you go back and say, give me the next page, it you know, doesn't start from the beginning. It jumps where you, where you left off. So, in this case here, I get page zero, I'm done, right? Now I start reading page one, same thing, I have to stall because it's not in memory. The disk goes and gets it, we put it on our buffer pool, and then once I have that, now I can, uh, now I can proceed operating it on it. So let's say this query here wants to scan the entire table, right? These are, for our table here, here's all the pages. So at this point, the database system could probably recognize, oh, I know you're gonna end up scanning the entire table, so rather than just wait, wait, me waiting for you to ask for each page one after another, let me go ahead and jump ahead and say, oh, I think you're also going to need page two and three. So let me go prefetch that for you, put into the buffer pool. So by the time you finish processing page one, and now you go ask me for page two or page three, it's already there. Now you don't have a stall. And again, based on how I laid out these pages on disk, that might have just been a sequential read, which, which is super fast. So by prefetching things ahead of time, I, you know, I, I'm minimizing the amount of random I.O. that I'm doing. Right? So then I just keep going this down and, and prefetch everything. So that, again, that minimizes the impact of, of these distals. So this example is pretty simple. Right? The, the operating system actually can figure this out too. Now, and, and, and MMAP will actually do this for you. Right? So in MMAP, it, you can pass a flag and say, I'm going to do a sequential read on these pages on disk. And it'll go ahead and prefetch a bunch of them ahead of time. 
And so again, that, that'll minimize the stalls having, because you had to read something from disk. So MMAP can figure this out without even knowing anything about what the query is trying to do. Right? The data system knows what the query wants to do and it can go prefetch ahead of time. But now there's going to be some queries where the operating system is not going to be able to know what to do, but we do in the database system because we know what the query wants. So, you, so an example of this would be like an index scan. So let's say I want to do a scan on this table and I want to get all the values. Uh, I want to find all the tuples where the value is between 100 and 250. So now let's say that I have an index on that value. And I've explained what an index is. Just think of this as like a, a glossary in, in your textbook that allows you to jump to a particular page that has the data that you want. Right? So it's a, instead of just doing a sequential scan, I can just jump through the index and find exactly what I'm looking for. So let's say that our, in our index pages, right, we know ahead of time what the ranges are. So when my query starts to do that scan, I always got to read the first page for the index because that's the root. Right? So I, you know, I have to jump to there. But now I'm going to do a lookup and say, well, I'm looking for my query was between 100 and 250. So I know that all the pages I need, or the values I want where it's greater than or equal to 100 are going to start on this side of the tree. So now I'm going to jump down into page one and read that. Right? That's still sequential at this point. So again, the operating system could probably figure this out. But now I'm going to branch and go down here. And I'm going to scan across the leaf nodes. But this is index page three, index page five. They're not contiguous with each other on, on disk. And so the operating system may try to end up prefetching page two and page three, but I don't need page two, that's wasted. And I need page five and it didn't prefetch that. So because we know what the query is gonna do, we can go ahead and prefetch exactly the pages that we want and bring them into our buffer pool uh, because we, again, we understand what the, what, what, what's actually the context what are the context of the query and what are these pages actually representing? Because the operating system just sees pages. It doesn't know what's in them. But we know, because we wrote this code, we know that these are index pages and they're connected together in some way. So we know how to do this traversal. So this doesn't come for free, right? There's some extra metadata we have to keep track of in these pages to say, like, here's the sibling, here's my starting point or my endpoint, here's his starting point. So I know whether I'm going to scan across over here. And actually, I can't know whether I need five before I look at three. So you know, this, this, I'm not saying this is like super easy to do, but you can kind of see again how we may not be jumping exactly through the, the pages sequentially in a way that the operating system is not going to be able to find. So again, this this is this to me this is the classic example of what we can do in our database system that the operating system cannot do because it doesn't doesn't know about what's in the data; it just sees a bunch of reads and writes. All right, the next optimization we can do is called scan sharing. So the idea here is that we can have queries piggyback off each other and reuse the data that, that one query is reading from disk and use that for its query. So this is different than, than result caching. Result caching is, you say, I run exactly the same query, and I compute some answer, and I cache that result. So that same query shows up again. I can just, rather than rerunning the query, I just give you the answer I had before. This is at a lower level at the buffer manager and the storage layer where we're now again, just have this cursor accessing pages, we can then reuse the pages we're, we're getting out from one thread for another thread. So the way this is going to work is that we're going to allow multiple queries to attach to a single cursor that's scanning through our pages and putting them to the buffer pool. It's almost like a pub sub thing where we say, I want to know whether you get a new page and then you can notify whatever thread that may be waiting for it, even though they're not the one that actually did the read. So depending on the implementation, the queries do not need to be exactly the same. Typically, in result caching, they do. In our, in our world here, they don't have to be. Just I need to know whether I'm reading the same pages. And then in some cases, too, also, if they're computing the, a similar result, we could share those intermediate results and across different threads. It's almost like a, it's called a materialized view. We'll cover this later in the semester. But for our purposes here, we're just, again, we're just looking at uh, page accesses. So again, the way it works is that if a query starts a scan, and then it, re it recognizes that there's another uh, query also doing the same scan. It just attaches itself to, to the first guy's cursor. And then as it gets pages, we get notified that that page came in and we, we, can, we can access it as well. So the important thing to know is that we have to keep track of where the second query came along, sort of got on the train for the cursor, so that we know if the cursor ends for the first query, there may be other data we have to go back and read. 
Right, so we can, if, if we want to look at everything, we start halfway, we want, we want to know where we started so we can come back and see the rest. So as far as I know, this technique is, is fully supported only in DB2 and SQL Server. It's super hard to get correct. All right, it seems like kind of trivial, but it, it can get pretty gnarly based on what the, the query is doing. Oracle supports has a basic uh, scare shanning they call cursor sharing, and then, but it only works if you have two exact queries running at the exact same time. Whereas these guys can extrapolate based on the query that, oh, I, need, I know you're reading this table, I need to read the same thing and jump on it. This thing has to say, I have two queries that are doing the exact same thing. So let's look at an example. So say we have our first query here, it's computing the sum on A. So the, quer the, qu the query's cursor is gonna start and it's just gonna start scanning through uh, the table looking at each page, right? So now let's say at this point here, it wants to read page three we don't have any, a free frame in our buffer pool, so we run our replacement policy algorithm to decide which of these pages we want to remove. In this case here, we do something simple and say, well, page zero was the last page, the, 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 the page that was the oldest since I've accessed it. So let me go ahead and replace that with page three, and then now I continue scanning. But now let's say after this happens, after we swap out page zero with page three, a second query shows up that also wants to do a sequential scan on this table. So without scan sharing, it'll just start at the beginning like the first guy and just scan all the way down. But this is actually the worst thing for us because the first thing it's gonna read is page zero, but we just threw that out on disk. So now we can end up thrashing because this guy can't proceed until page zero is, is in. So we, this is gonna, you know, it has to stall and to go fetch it back in. But I, I just had it in memory, but I got rid of it. So that's bad. So with scan sharing, this guy just hops along for the ride and reads the same thing that Q1 reads. And you know, produces and computes whatever intermediate result it needs for that part of, part of the data it's looking at. So now at this point, Q1 is done, so its cursor goes away, and then Q2 starts over at the beginning, and knows, knows that, oh, I started when you were reading page three, so this is how long I need to scan down until I get my final result. Yes? The part of the memory like where these queries store their data, like while they are processing, they must also need some memory for storing their data, right? So that is separate from the buffer. This question is, um, each query is computing, I'll say, intermediate results as, as it reads this data. So they also now need a memory region to, to put this data in that's separate from this buffer pool. Yes. So we'll see this in an example on Postgres in, in a second. But the... Typically, that memory will also be backed by a buffer pool, right? And because, like, if I end up computing something, you know, say I'm computing a join, and the output of that join operator doesn't fit in memory, I need to be able to, to start evicting those pages out to disk. So, so any ephemeral memory like that would still be backed by a buffer pool. But whether it's in the global buffer pool, whether it's a private one for the query, it depends on the implementation. But we don't need to bring pages from the disk for that buffer pool, right? His question statement is, I don't, need to, I don't need to bring pages from disk in for that query intermediate result buffer pool. And unless you're storing because it's too big? Yeah, and let, yeah, so as I'm writing data, like so this guy, and this is a trivial table because the average is it's, it's a scalar, right? But let's say this is you know some really complex co computation. As I'm generating, as I'm scanning this data, I'm updating my intermediate result. I may overflow memory and those get swapped out to disk. So I'm writing to memory and then they would just get, get written out to disk as needed. But it's not like I would read for my query. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. Because like, anything you need to read from like the low level database pages, you're gonna put in the buffer pool that everyone can see. Right? So again, this is another good point. This is a shared data structure, right? So it does, like Q1 is, is, was reading pages uh, and putting into the buffer pool. Any other thread that needed these pages is allowed to go go ahead and read it, right? The pin latch, the pin that just tells you that hey, don't swap this out the disk, the doesn't doesn't prevent anybody else from reading it at the same time you are. There's higher level things like the locks that keep track of what pages you're allowed to read and write from, or what, what you know, with database objects. This is the pin just basically says hey, I'm 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 operating on this, don't swap it out. So that that answers your question. Okay. So. This is another good example of what's awesome about the relational model. Because the relational model is unordered. Meaning like, it doesn't, like, I can actually have Q2 start anywhere for some queries, 
and the answer I'm going to produce may be different from based on when I execute it, but it's still considered correct. So if I change this query to put compute the average and I limit it to 100, meaning I only want to compute the average of 100 tuples, it doesn't specify that I, I can only I have to look at the first 100 tuples. So I could start here at page three with my with my uh, scan sharing on this cursor and see the first 100 tuples in these first three pages. And then that's, a, that's enough for me to compute the result. If I started now at the beginning, I may actually get a different result. But according to the relational model, that's still fine. Because the database is unordered. Yes? Is it equally valid if we just read through whatever non-sequential pages have to be at that time? Yeah, so he, perfect. So he says, would it also still be valid if we, rather than having the cursor say, all right, well, let's go look in my disk page and start fetching them. What if I go check in the buffer pool and figure out what's actually in memory and compute the aggregation of this particular query with, with what's in memory? Absolutely, yes. And the smarter systems can do that. Again, it doesn't matter, right? It's in memory. Uh, as long as I see 100 tuples, then that, this query is still correct. Now, this is we don't, like, you wouldn't want to write this, but uh, it's, you know, it's still valid. All right, the, the last optimization I'm going to talk about is the buffer pool bypass. So it's sort of related to his question before about like, the intermediate result memory. But let's say that I have some queries where we're doing sequential scans, and the, I don't want to pay the penalty of having to go look up in the page table and look in my buffer pool to go figure out whether the page I'm looking for is in memory. Furthermore, I also don't want to pollute the cache with maybe reading some data that I'm not going to need in the near future. So the, 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 with buffer pool bypass or buffer cache bypass, depending on what system it is, the idea is that you allocate a small amount of memory to, the, to, to your, your query, to the thread running it, and then as it reads pages from disk, right, if it's not in the buffer pool, it has to go to disk to get it. Rather than putting it in the buffer pool, it just puts it in its local memory. And then when the query's done, all that just gets dropped and thrown away. All right? And you do this again because you want to avoid the overhead of going to the page table, which is, you know, it's a hash table with it latches. It's not, it's, not, it's not super expensive, but it's not free. It's not cheap. So in Formex, these are called light scans, but pretty much every single, again, major database system uh, support something like this. I don't know. I don't know whether MySQL 8 does. I don't think 5.7 does. Um, and then again, if you recognize that you know, th you only really want to do this if you know the intimate result or the thing you're scanning is not not huge. Right? If, if you're doing a sort that's going to be you know terabytes of memory, then you want to be backed by the buffer pool because that thing can, can can page up the disk as needed. All right. The last thing to sort of understand also too is. What's actually going on below the database system? What's happening as we read pages uh, from the operating system? What is the operating system actually doing? So again, all our disk operations are going to be going through the OS API, at the lowest level, like fopen, fread, fwrite. Uh, you know, we're not going to access the raw, raw disk themselves. So because we're now going through the operating system, by default, the operating system is going to maintain its own separate cache for the file system. All right, this is called the OS page cache. So that means that again, as I read a page from, from disk, the OS is going to keep a cap copy of it in its file system cache or OS page cache, and then I'll have another copy of it in, in my buffer pool. So most database systems do not want, to do, want you to do this, do not want the operating system to do this. So when you open a file, you pass in the, the POSIX flag O direct or direct IO, where you have the OS not do any of that uh, caching itself, and you manage what's in memory uh, on your own. So pretty much every single database system, when you go read the manual, they will tell you that, make sure you can actually you know, turn this on. The only database system that does this is, uh, is Postgres, as far as I know. The only major database system that relies on the OS page cache is Postgres. And so the reason they said they do this is because they claim that from an engineering standpoint, it's one less additional caching thing they have to manage. Right, it still has their own buffer pool, but it's not going to be as big. It's not going to use all the memory on the system like MySQL or, 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 or Oracle would use. They're going to let the OS do some additional management themselves. So from an engineering perspective, it's less overhead on their part from actually maintaining that, that piece of the system. And it's a minor performance penalty to, to rely on this, which you'll see in a second. Okay? So I like using Postgres for, for demos um, because it's almost like a textbook implementation 
of, of a database system and you, it actually exposes a lot of the you know, important concepts that we're talking about pretty, pretty easily. Call here. Okay. All right, so this is running, again, a machine back in the lab. Um, let me turn on the lights. And I type on this laptop because it's a pain to type on the on the surface. I hate the keyboard. All right. So this is running. This is just running HTOP. It's a better version of top. And the thing I want to I want to focus on is is the memory usage stuff up here. So the green bars are telling you what's the resident set size of the processes running on the, on this machine, right? It's the the memory they've malloced. The, the orange bar here, that's the file system page cache. That's the operating system's page cache. So again, as whatever processes are running on this machine, as they go read, uh, if they're not using direct I.O., if they go read a, a, a page or from a file, the OS is also going to cache it as well. So we, we can blow this all away. So in, this is running on Linux. So in Linux, we can do a... Um, That's that. Oh, four, sorry. So we can run this command um, that we basically, we pass, a, we, we sync the OS, the file system cache, and we pass this flag uh, three into the proc file system to allow us to force the operating system to flush our page cache. So now if we go back and look at HTOP, now we see that the, the, the total amount of memory being used by the machine went down to 3 gigs. Right? It's, it had 32 gigs before, but now it's down to 3 gigs. So we blew away the file system cache entirely. Okay? So now let's go, uh, let's go bring up po uh, Postgres. Um, the first thing I want to do, though, is restart it. And so by restarting it, we're going to blow away its, um, its, its buffer pool. All right, so now, bring this up, and then reconnect. We'll turn on timing, and then we'll turn off the, the parallel threads. So we're going to use that same table I showed in last class, 10 million entries of a bunch of decimals. So we can run this query. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to use explain again, but I'm going to pass in analyze, two flags, analyze and buffers. So analyze, again, is going to actually run the query and also show you the query plan, what happened. This buffers flag is going to tell you how much data it read from disk, what, what percentage of the, of the pages it was reading were in the buffer pool versus on, on disk. And so because we blew away the file system cache, we blew away the buffer pool because we restarted the database system, it should, it, the hit should be zero. Right? And you see that. It said that uh, for the buffer pool, it had to read 400, 4, 444, 248 pages. Uh, you had to read the table from disk, and it took uh, 1,300 milliseconds, 1 1.3 seconds. So if I run the same query again, now you see it says that the hit was 32. So it was able to read 32 pages uh, that were already in the puffer pool, um, and then the rest it had to then read from disk. All right, and the reason why it wasn't all the pages is because Postgres maintains a, a, a buffer pool, sort of a small buffer pool ring per query, that's 32 pages. So for this one, it was allowed to read 32 pages from the last time it ran. If I run this again, it should go to, I think, to 64. Yes, so it keeps growing in size as I'm executing the queries over and over again because it recognizes that, oh, the, the, the data that I need is, is, uh, is not my buffer pool. Let me increase the size of, of its cache. All right, so now what we can do is we can force the database system to put everything in, into, into memory. So they have this extension in Postgres that comes by default when, when, you, when you install it, called pgwarm. And all this does is that we're, it's a function that we invoke on the data system to say, hey, go take all the pages for this, this table and bring it to our buffer pool. Right? And it tells you that I ran, I did that, and I read uh, 44,248 pages. Remember when I ran the query the first time, the, it, it said it had to read 4,428 pages from disk, because it's getting exactly, you know, that's the, the number of pages for this table. But those 64 pages were already 
He says those 64 pages are already there, right? So this is like forcing to just read everything. And actually, I think those 64 pages might have been... Yeah, I think it just doesn't look to see what's in memory. It just says, I'm going to get everything. Because if I do it again, it should give me the same number. Yeah, it just reads everything. All right, so now, if I go and run that query again, uh, I'm doing a little bit better. My hit is 16,000. 16, again, 16,000 pages I needed were in memory. So I hit, hit, had it hit in the buffer pool. But I still had to read a bunch from disk. Let me take a guess why. Yes? Is it still loading everything into the buffer pool? He's, why is it still loading everything into the buffer pool? Depends on the size of the buffer pool, right? So we can do this in Postgres. So Postgres has a flag called shared uh, buffers. And it tells me that it's currently set to 128 megabytes. Right? But the size was what, 4428? Four, 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 so select. You can use, again, you can, I love databases. You can, you can use them as a calculator. So 4428 times 8. Um, oh, Divided by or 1024, that'll give me megabytes. So the size of my table I'm reading is 345 megabytes. So again, the shared buffer is 128, but my size of my table is 345. So I can go to the Postgres configuration, in theory, for, um, this is Postgres 11. And then go find, um, that particular parameter, and lo and behold, it's 128 megabytes. So let me set it to, let's be generous, let's say 360 megabytes, right? So now we will restart Postgres. We will blow away our file system cache from the, from the operating system, because again, as, as we read that page in, actually, we go back to HTOP, um, it got, I mean, it's hard to see. It got a little bit bigger. Like you can see there's one bar there because that's, 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 that's our table we were reading in. So let me go blow away the file system cache. Um, and now I go back to Postgres. I need to reconnect, um, turn on timing, set that to this, turn up parallel threads, check to see that shared buffers is now Oh, I'm an idiot, right? Sorry. It's server 10, client 11. Too many Postgres installations, sorry. So we go back here, it's this. <laughs> what about the 128? I said, what, 360? Now we start Postgres. Go back here, reconnect, 360. Okay, good. Turn on timing, turn on parallel threads, uh, pre-warm. We had 448 pages, and now I've run that query again. And now my hit is 44248. So I gave the data system the right amount of memory, I pre-fetched pre everything, and now everything is hitting the buffer pool. I didn't, have to, I didn't have to touch a disk at all for this particular query. I do every lookup, every page I'm, I need to access, I'm going looking in that, in that page table and finding the page, the page reference in, in a frame, but everything's in memory here. So how can we prove that the, that the database system Postgres is using, relying on the file system cache? So let's turn off to explain everything here. Let's just see how long it actually takes. All right, it's so actually, so the first time, uh, it was 1250, and it got a little faster, and then it's 733. All right, so it takes roughly 700 milliseconds. So what we can do is go restart Postgres. Um, and then that blows away the buffer pool. And now if I come back and reconnect to Postgres, which I think I need to. Yep. So now I'm, now I'm reconnected. I still have to go turn on timing, turn off parallel threads. 
I run that same query. Before, when everything was out on disk, I think it took uh, 1.3 seconds. So this one, and then with, with everything's in the buffer pool, it took 700 milliseconds. So this one should be roughly a little bit, oh. Our timing was off, sorry. Well, that ruined the demo, fuck. So go back, I go back to this, restart this. Go back to this, reconnect, timing is on. Now it's on, yeah, yeah I got it. <laughs> Parallel threads are off. Again, so I'm gonna run this query, I, blew, I restart the, the database system, that blows away the buffer pool, but the operating system still has its, its file system cache. So now if I run this query, we're gonna have a bunch of buffer pool misses uh, because nothing is in memory, but it's still not gonna take the full time, right? Took 800 milliseconds instead of, instead of 1.3 seconds because the data that it needed was in the file system cache. If I run this again, I should get now 700 milliseconds. No. <laughs> there it goes. Let's go figure out what happened. Still reading data from disk. Why is that? Well, it's still running fast, even though, although that time, I think it's because that time's slower because I think it's running explain analyze. Um, It'll slowly get faster as it increases the cache size for that for that uh, query. So I think I think it's a query cache thing rather than the global thing. But again, the main takeaway we showed is that we had to give it the data system enough memory, put everything into our buffer pool, uh, and then we were able to get the the, the full speed performance. All right, so any questions? Yes. Pre -worm, you pre warm twice, and the second time you pre warm it's like thirty percent faster. Like why is that? I pre warm twice. What do you mean? Like you ran pre warm and then you. Oh, yeah. that's the file system cache. Okay. That's the that's the OS cache. Question, yes. So uh, the first time when you put uh, the entire table in the buffer pool, uh, yes. it showed that the uh, entire 44,000 uh, rows were put, put in the buffer pool. Yes. But when we tried to read it, uh, like it like the hit was just 16,000. Uh, like since everything was in the buffer pool, like what was So the very first time I did this, the, the buffer pool size was 128 megabytes. The table size is 345 megabytes. Right, so how did it put everything in the buffer pool? Then? It didn't. That's why I had, uh, I had still had lookups in the read from disk. But it said 44,000 already, right? At the very beginning? Yeah. Oh. This is not what we're spending all our time, but this is, this is walk through it. All right, so let's do this. Go back. We're going to blow away the, the file system cache, restart Postgres. Going to, now we go look in, in, in our, um, I mean, that, that, that bar is not attributable potentially for, uh, for Postgres. Like, there's other things running on the, on the system. But I blew away the file system cache. I restarted Postgres. Now there's nothing in memory. So I go back to Postgres. Need to reconnect, turn off parallel threads. And so if I run the query now the first time, Right, nothing's in memory. I had to read forty-four thousand pages. Okay, so that's expected. I, pre warm tells the database system to go read everything that's on disk for that table, bring it to my buffer pool. Yeah, exactly. Like entire forty-four thousand. All forty-four thousand pages. Yes, I can do this again. Right, it read forty-four thousand pages. Now I run the same query. And now my hit is exactly 44,000. Hit means I, it, it was hit, I, the thing I was looking for was found in the buffer pool. So I forced the data system to bring everything back into memory. And the first example, I, I only had 128 megabytes, so I couldn't put everything in. Yes? Yes. Great. So our question is, so I said in the beginning that, that Postgres is the only system that, that does, you, the only major system that relies on the OS page cache. Why doesn't everybody else do this? 
Well, because now I'm going to have two copies of every single page potentially. So I could have a page in the OS page cache, then I'm going to have a copy of that page in my, my buffer pool. Because now if I modify that page, now it's not an exact copy anymore. So the OS has the old one and I have the new one. So it's, it's redundant data. So you're more efficient in terms of memory usage if you manage everything yourself. Furthermore, too, uh, you know, th think of like in, in different database systems, I mean, you, most data systems support Linux now, right? But like the major ones, they got to support Windows, BSD, all these different operating systems where the OS page cache may have different performance implications or different policies. And so to guarantee consistent performance or consistent behavior across different OSs, you just manage everything yourself. That's a good question. Yes? This hit number, is it the number of tuples that were hit? Or? This is the number of pages. But again, so like I, it's it, Postgres is eight kilobyte pages. Oh. I take this number, multiply it eight, divide by 1024. That tells me the number of megabytes of my, my thing. I set my buffer pool size to that size and then I can guarantee everything fits. Yes? How does the Postgres uh, buffer pool interact with OS cache? The question is, how does the OS bu buffer pool interact with the OS page cache? Yeah. Again, the, it's like, His question is, like, are there different options of how to use it? Yeah. No, like, so they, like, they, it's transparent to the, the program. Like, I call read, F read to go read a page from, from, the, from disk. If the OS has it in the page cache, it serves me that page. Otherwise, it goes out and disk and gets it. That's all transparent to me. If I pass that flag direct I.O., that tells the operating system do not cache anything, and it's always going to go to disk and get it. So the, so the OS cache is in between the disk and the debugger. Yes, yeah, so the OS page cache is in between the, the, sort of the disk and the, data, and the database. Absolutely, yes. It's going to matter also, too, a lot when we start doing writes. If you call, like, you, open, you write a C program, you call fwrite, does, is the operating system actually going to write that right away? No, it puts it in the page cache, and at some later point, the disk scheduler says, all right, let me, let me go write this out. It's only when I call fsync when, when, is when it actually gets written. But if I want to complete control of how I'm writing everything out the disk, I want to use direct I.O. And most database systems do that. Yes? When you had buffer pool of 128 MB, right? So yeah. you brought all the 380 MB, 360 MB into the buffer pool. So what would have happened? The first 128 MB would have been overwritten. Now when you did the query, you got hit. But when you started the query, you have started from the starting. So you shouldn't have got hit. Because the memory present was the later 128 MB present. Let's, let's, I, mean, I want to get through the, the thing for the project, but let's, let, we'll talk about it afterwards, okay? All right. So the thing I want to talk about now quickly is the buffer replacement policy. So again, we talked about how, all right, we, we, how to find the page we want based on the page ID and the page table. But now, you know, in all my examples, we had enough memory mostly. And so now we want to talk about what happens if I need to bring a page in and I don't have space for it. What do I do? So the things we're going to care about in a replacement policy are obviously correctness, right? We don't want to write out data or evict data that, that someone pinned before they're actually done with it. We're going to care about accuracy because we want to make sure that we, we evict pages that are very unlikely to be used in the future. So we minimize the number of disk seeks we have. We want our replacement policy to be fast because we don't, you know, as we're doing a lookup in the page table, we're holding latches and we don't want to have to run some MD complete algorithm to figure out what page to evict, right? Because that may take longer than actually reading the page anyway. And of course, obviously, we don't want to have a lot of metadata overhead of keeping track of all this additional data. Like, we don't want to have the metadata for a page to keep track of how, how likely it's going to be used uh, to be larger than the page itself. So these replacement policies, again, are, is another good example of what distinguishes between the high-end, very expensive enterprise databases and the open source guys. Because the high-end ones have very sophisticated re uh, replacement policies. They track statistics of how pages are being used. They try to extrapolate from what the queries are actually doing and to try to make the best decision. Whereas in the, the open source guys, or the, 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 the newer systems, not saying they're bad, but they don't have you know, millions of dollars and, and, and decades spent trying to make this thing run fast as possible. And so that, you know, they'll do something more simple, which is what we're going to talk about here. Uh, this is like one of the oldest problems in CS. Like everybody and their uncle has a paper uh, in, over the years on how to do caching and things like that. I have one, right? Like, this is, this is like one of the oldest problems in computer science. There's a, there's a ton, a, lo a long history of this. 
All right, so the easiest technique to use, and pretty much everyone does the first time, is LRU, or least recently used. So all we do, do here is just keep track of a timestamp of when a, the last time a page was accessed, and then when we have to go figure out what page to go evict, we just look to see which, which page has that, the oldest timestamp, and that's the one we go ahead and remove. So the way to speed this up, instead of just keeping a track of, of a, uh, you know, a timestamp for a page, because then we have to do a sequential scan across all our pages in the buffer pool to figure out which one has the lowest timestamp, we can just maintain a separate data structure, like a queue, that, that are, that's sorted by the, their, their timestamps. So anytime somebody reads and writes a page, uh, we just pull it out of the queue and put it back to the end, because right? it's a first in, first out. What you guys will have to implement in, in the project is an approximation of LRU called clock. Actually, quick show of hands, who, who, who here has heard a clock before? Nobody. Awesome. Okay. Who here is, I mean, LRU, I want you to know, right? Okay, good. So clock, so LRU is, is an exact least recently used. Clock is an approximation of this, where you don't have to track the timestamp exactly every, for every single uh, page. So instead, we're all, the only information we need to keep track of is a single reference bit per page that tells you whether that page was accessed since the last time you checked it. So you're going to organize your pages in a circular buffer, like a clock, and then you have a clock hand that goes around and does sweeps and checks to see whether that reference bit is set to 1 or 0. And if it's set to 0, then you know it has been accessed since the last time you checked it, and therefore it can be evicted. All right? So say I have page, uh, pages 1, 2, 3, 4, and again, each one has their own reference bit. In the very beginning, the reference bit is set to 0. So let's say that some, some query accesses page 1, so I'm going to go ahead and flip its reference bit to 1. And no matter how many times somebody accesses this, this page, it's always set to one, it's not a counter. So now, now I need to evict the page because I don't have any more space. So my clock hand is going to start with this first one. I see that its reference bit is set to one, and therefore it's been accessed, and therefore I should not evict it. But now I reset its reference bit to zero, and then go on to the, to the next one. And I'm going to sweep around. If I come back around and it's set to zero, then I know I, I can evict it. So this guy here, his bit is set to zero. So we can go ahead, evict it, remove it, and replace it with uh, a new page. And then we don't set its reference bit to one, we just set it to zero, and then move on to, to the next one. So let's say now page three and four have been accessed, so we check that, reset it to zero, check that, reset it to zero. Now we come back to the page one, which is the first one we checked, its reference bit was zero since the last time we checked, so therefore it can be evicted. So again, reason why this is an approximation is because as I'm evicting pages, I'm not evic evicting exactly the one that's the most least, least recently used. It's sort of, a, 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 you know, it's just saying within some time window, these pages have not been used, and therefore it's, it, there's, I, I, I can go ahead and evict them. And the intuition here is that if the page hasn't been used in a while, then it's probably not going to be used again in the, in, the, in the near future, so therefore it's something I can go ahead and evict. Right? Right? So that assumption works a lot, works well for simple things, like doing point queries to go access single things. Both clock and LRU are susceptible to what is called sequential flooding. And what this means is that when we have a sequential scan that's going to read every single page, that's going to pollute our page cache, and that's going to end up having, uh, we could end up evicting pages that maybe we do really want, that are going to be used very, 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 uh, in, in the near future. But because that scan read a bunch of pages, all those pages are going to have uh, newer timestamps than, than the page I actually do want. Right? In this case here, the most recently page, uh, used page is actually the one I want to evict, not the least recently used. So this is another good example where you, if you can have different buffer, pool, different buffer pools or different tables based on how queries are going to access them, maybe one I want to use most recently used and another one I want to use least recently used. So let's look at an example. Let's say I have one query that's doing a point lookup where, where, a equals, uh, where, where ID equals 1, and it, and it reads page 0. So I go ahead and fetch that into my buffer pool, and I'm fine. So then now I have another query that's going to do a sequential scan, so it's going to rip through uh, all, my, uh, all my pages, and then when it wants to make space for page 3, if, again, we're using least recently used, uh, then it would figure out that, oh, page 0 is the least recently used. Let me go ahead and evict that and put in page 3. But in my workload, I'm executing queries that look like the first one over and over again. So now if I execute this query all over again, now I read page zero, I just evicted it, and now I'm screwed because now I've got to go out and disk and get it. 
All right, so what I really would have should have done is, is evicted one or two because this scan is going to go through, go through and read more data, and it's unlikely that anybody else is going to come and read this thing here. So the way, there's three ways to get around this. We sort of covered some of these uh, uh, so far. So the first is to do, uh, it's called LRUK, where K is just, you keep track of the number, the, 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 time, the number of times, multiple timestamps every single time this, this page is accessed. So now when you want to say, which, which one should I remove? You don't look to see which one has the lowest timestamp. You go look at the intervals between those timestamps and you say, which one has the longest amount of time between one access to the next access? And then can use that to figure out which one's the least likely to be used. So this, because we're using the history to, again, to estimate when it's going to be accessed again, to make, help us make a better decision about what pages should be evicted. So LRUK is what's used in, uh, in, 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 in the more sophisticated data systems will do something like this. I don't know, I think MySQL might use this. I, I, don't, I don't remember. All right, the next optimization we can do, which we sort of already talked about with uh, having multiple buffer pools, is to have localization per query. So rather than have that, you know, as I'm scanning the table and putting it into the global buffer pool, if I have a small little uh, set aside some pages in the buffer pool that are specific to my query, anybody can still read them, but it's, it's I'm keeping track of how I'm using pages. So then, then when I want to make a decision on what to evict from my query, I evict the ones that are least recently used for me, not the global view. So we saw this in Postgres. Postgres had that, we hit, remember we showed the hit was like 32, then with the 64, right? That's this little ring buffer that, that they're keeping track of what pages that that query's accessing to make decisions what, what to evict. All right, the last one is to do priority hints. Again, this is where we talked about before when we have, we have indexes, we know how they're scanning data, know, how, know what pages they're gonna access. So we can use that information to make decisions about what to evict. So let's say we have our, our, our B plus tree or whatever tree data structure we want. And they have a bunch of queries that are going to insert data where there's a global counter for this table or just incrementing it by one and inserting over and over again, like a, a serial key or auto increment key. So if we're now sorted on, if this index is sorted on ID from min to max, we know that every single time we do an insert, the, the ID value is always going to be one more than the, the last one we just inserted. So that means we're always going to be going down the right side of the tree and touching these pages. So therefore, we should have hints up into the buffer pool manager and say, these pages should try to stay in memory. I don't care about these so much about these other ones here. Or likewise, if I have a query that does lookups on, on different IDs, uh, or any, actually any query that does a lookup on this index, I know I'm always going to be going through the root page because that's how I enter this index. I have to go through that. So therefore, I want to make sure that's always pinned in memory. That, that always stays there. Because right, otherwise, if I, if, if, I get, if I get to the bottom and I, I need space and I evict this thing, that's a bad idea because that, you know, that, that's the least recently used, but I know that the next query is going to come through and go to the, exactly through that page. So again, this is what the commercial systems can do, provide this extra information up above. All right. The last thing to talk about is how do we actually handle dirty pages? So remember, there's a, there's a dirty bit on the page that says whether a query has modified the contents of that page since the last time it, since, since, since it was brought into the buffer pool. So when we now make a decision on what page to evict to bring a new page in, the fastest thing we could do is just find a page that was, that's not marked dirty and immediately just drop it and you know, use its frame for a new buffer pool. The slower thing we have to do is if a page is, is dirty, we have to write it back out to disk safely before we can reuse that space for, for our new page. So now there's this trade-off we have to make in our replacement policy to decide, well, there's a bunch of pages that are all, that are all clean and I could drop them super easily, but they actually may be needed in the near future. So I don't want to actually drop them. Instead, I want to pay the penalty to write out a dirty page, flush it, remove it from my buffer pool and reuse its space. So how you actually balance them is, is super hard. Right, because again, I, I, in this case here, to do a, a disk read, if I had to write out a dirty page, it's two disk IOs. One IO to write out the dirty page, then remove it from the buffer pool, and then another IO to read the page that I want. In this case here, it's one IO to just, just go read the page that I want because I can drop the, the page that's already in the buffer pool. So how you actually figure that out, again, is super hard. And this is what the commercial systems, in my opinion, do better than the open source ones. 
So a way to get around this, to avoid that, the, the problem of ha having to, uh, to write a page out as soon as I need a free space in my buffer pool, I can do background writing. So periodically, the data system is going to have a thread that's going to look through my buffer pool, figure out what pages are marked dirty, and just write them out to disk. And so that way, I can flip them to be marked as clean. And now when I do run my replacement policy to decide what page to remove, I have a bunch of clean pages I, I, can, I can drop right away. So you got to be careful when you do this because you don't want to write out dirty pages before the log records that correspond to, the, to, the, to modifying them to make them dirty. You want to make sure they're, the log records are written out to disk first before you write out the dirty pages. We'll have a whole lecture on why that's the case later on in the semester. But just know that it's, like, it's not just a, I can just blindly write any page I want. I have to do some extra steps and protections to make sure I'm writing things in the right order. And this is something that MMAP can, cannot do. All right, so I'm going to skip this uh, for the other memory pools. Just, we've already sort of covered this. It's more than just the pages from tables or indexes. There's, when we run queries, we also need it to generate some, some information. All right, so the, again, the, the whole point of this lecture was to talk about how we can manage memory better than the OS, because we know what queries are doing, we know what's in the pages, we know how things are being accessed, and we can make better decisions. And essentially, we're going to use information on what's in the query to, you know, for all these different things that we talked about. And there's a bunch of different optimizations we can apply to help us make this work better. All right, so any questions about buffer pool? All right, here's what you really care about. Project one, right? So the, uh, for the first project, you're going to be building your own uh, buffer pool manager and replacement policy. So this will all be done in our new database system called BusTub. Uh, which is it's an open source system. It's disk basic, and it's you will see this. There'll be uh, stub files in the code that you would download from GitHub that will clearly show here's the functions you need to write, and here's here's how to actually you know implement the, what we're asking you to do. So the project is, is the write up is available online. The grade scope isn't been set up yet. We'll do that later today. But if you can finish this project in a single day, come talk to me because we, we want you to do other things. Um, <laughs> So we are going to already provide you the disk manager and already the page layouts. So you don't have to worry about that. You just, we'll give you a page, a block, a block of pages, uh, and it's up for you to decide how to store them in memory and then and, and invoke the disk manager to write them out as needed. So for the first one, you're going to, you're, we have a separate class called Clock Replacer, and you'll be implementing the clock policy that I talked about here today. Again, it's an approximation of, uh, of LRU. We just sweep the hand and, and flip these reference, reference bits. So that means you need to keep track of um, as pages are being accessed, because you'll see this in the, in the buffer pool API, you have to know that when I say read a page or write a page, uh, that you go update the reference bit inside of your LRU replacer, or sorry, your, your clock replacer. So the one thing to be important to know is that if you do a sweep and all the pages have been uh, were, were modified, then you just pick whatever one has the lowest frame ID. Or if all the pages are pinned and you can't free one, then you pick one with the lowest page ID. Because right? otherwise, you just spin forever. And this will be in the write-up. The major effort will be on the, on the buffer manager. So you'll implement the clock replacer algorithm first, and then you'll hook that into your, your buffer pool manager. And for this one, it's, again, it's up for you to decide how you actually want to maintain your memory, how you decide what internal data structures you want to keep track of, what, what pages are available, what pages are, are, are dirty, what pages are, are being pinned. Right? You can do whatever you want. It's just you have to implement the API that, that we expose to you. So it's been super, the thing that always tricks up students every year is to make sure you get the ordering of the operations of how to pin pages correct. Right? So we'll, we'll do multi-threading graded tests. We'll try to read a page and pin it at the same time. And you have to make sure that everything turns out in the right order. And th this will be more clear when you look at the write-up and see what we're asking you to do. So how to get started. So again, everything is available on, on GitHub. You want to go to your, if you don't have a GitHub account, sign up one. It's free. There's also, I think, an educational one that you get extra stuff. Um, but basically, you'll go to the GitHub page for the, for the, the, the database system, and there'll be a little fork button. You fork it into your private repo. Uh, fork it into your own repo. Mark it as private so nothing's public. Uh, and then just do all your changes in there. Yeah, if you sign up for the GitHub account, you can get uh, free private forked repos. Right, because if you put everything public, then other students can see what you're doing and then potentially copy from you. Um, the very first thing you should try to do today or tomorrow, as soon as possible, be super helpful. Try to get the the software to build on your whatever machine you're going to do your development on. 
So it works on Ubuntu, it works on OS X, uh, it works on Windows with the Windows Server or Server Lite Linux, whatever this package you can download and install. Um, the thing though for OS X is not going to support the Clang formatting stuff that I'll talk about in a second. Uh, so Gradescope will run this for you. You can run it in Docker. If you, this is the problem, we can also give you a VM image, but you have to you have to figure this out on your own. We'll, we'll have instructions to try to help this out. It does not compile on an Android machine. We tried it, it doesn't work. The, the, the software they have on there is too slow. If this is a problem, if you don't have your own laptop, please email me and we'll figure something out, okay? So, things to note. You should not change any file that other than what you must hand in because we're basically gonna blow everything away. There's four files you, you, you have to turn in. We blow everything else away and plop your code on top of the, the latest version of the, the system and run all your tests. The projects are accumulative, meaning if you bomb this one, you're gonna have problems later on because uh, you know, the next project is actually gonna use the buffer pool manager that you build today or build now. We're also not gonna be providing solutions at the beginning, um, and then we're not gonna help you debug your code on Piazza. Another thing we're doing new this year is that we're requiring you to write good looking code. Normally people write shit code, uh, and so now we have a bunch of checks to make sure it actually conforms to a good style guide. So we follow the Google C++ style guide and we also follow the Docs and Javadoc style guide. So we have checks already in place that will check all these things for you. Like if you call make format, it'll make sure your code looks pretty in the, in the C++ style guide. But there's a bunch of other things like how you allocate memory, uh, how you set up your for loops and so forth that we use Clang Tidy and Clang Format to, to enforce uh, more, more detail. So you'll run these commands like check Clang Tidy, click, check Censored, check Lint. It will throw errors. It won't correct it for you. It'll throw errors and say, your code looks crappy. Here's how to fix it. Okay? And we're going to run those in grade scope. So when you turn it in, if you write crappy code, it'll, you'll, get, you'll get a zero score because you'll, you'll fail these tests. And so this is what I'm saying. So Linux and Windows, I think this works. For OS X, I don't think this works, but again, we can provide you a VM that you can do all your development in there. Okay? Last thing, don't plagiarize. We will run your code through Moss. There's some, some people in China that take the code and have already implemented some stuff. Theirs is all crap. We've run it. It doesn't work. Uh, <laughs> don't make your stuff, again, don't put your stuff on the public repo because if, if I, we, we run your stuff and someone copies from you because your, your account was public, we run them Moss and you both come up as being duplicates of each other. I don't know who stole from who. Right, so you both are going to fail, okay? So don't put any of your code public. You can do this in the end of the semester, because I know you want to go in the job market and be like, oh, here's what I did in this class. Truth be told, no one's actually going to care, because everyone's implementing the same thing. It's not like an independent study where you, you, you make some break, good breakthrough. So employers, they don't care that much that you have your project online. But if you want to do it in the end of the semester, we're fine with that, okay? Any questions? Next, hash table.